But it works. Good evening. Today is Monday, August 23rd, 2021, and it is 7 o'clock, and I'd like to call this meeting of the Lansing City Council to order and ask that the clerk please, clerk please call the roll. Okay. Council Member Betts. Council Member Betts is absent. Council Member Dunbar. Council Member Garza. Council Member Garza is absent. Uh, Council Member Hussein. Here. Council Member Jackson. Council Member Spadafore. Present. Council Member Spitzley. Yeah. Council Member Wood. Here. There are six members present. We have a quorum. Thank you. And I would note that Council Members Garza and Betts have both asked for excused absences, which we will dispense with later on in the evening. Okay. We are to the meditation and Pledge of Allegiance. Sure. Uh, first, I have someone that I'd like to uh, draw Council's attention to this evening to keep in our thoughts. Rachel Willis from the Lansing School Board has asked that I have our thoughts reflect Cam uh, Camilla Singleton Dodd. Camilla was the daughter of the late Bishop Alfred P. Singleton and Lady Elizabeth Singleton, founding pioneers of the Bread House Ministries, formerly known as the Bethlehem Temple. Uh, they were 30 years and they were a sister to the current pastor of the Bread House, Bishop Alfred Singleton II. She passed away surrounded by family on Friday, August 13, 2021. She was a founding member of the Singletons, which reached the top 40 on the gospel charts in 2006. Her passing was sudden and leaves behind two children. Celebration of her life is scheduled for Saturday, August 28th at 11 at the Bread House. So I ask you to keep her and her family in your thoughts this evening. Anyone else from the council? Council Member Wood. Um, thank you, President Spadafore. I have a couple that I'd like us to remember. Linda Sanchez um, Gonzalez lost her aunt um, early this morning. So if we could remember uh, Linda in our thoughts and prayers. Joan Bowers' uh, father uh, passed away um on august 17th at the age of 96. he coached in the lansing school system for 26 years lastly for our thoughts and prayers my nephew rick Coleman, who died saturday of colon cancer at the age of 36. he was a firefighter um, ems and after being diagnosed with colon rectal cancer became a 911 dispatcher for the Ashley Fire and Rescue in Gratiot County 911. Please remember Rick's dad, Chuck, his mother, Myrna, Rick's wife, uh, Kristen, his 11-year-old daughter, Ruthie, his 10-year-old daughter, Claire, his eight-year-old daughter, Gracie, and his six-year-old son, Grant. And his Aunt Carol. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, please join me in a moment of meditation. You have for your approval the printed council of proceedings of July 12th, 26th, and August 9th. Mr. Vice President. Sure, I would move the meeting minutes as presented. It's a proper motion before us. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. Motion carries. Okay, we are to special ceremonies and presentations, and it's my understanding the first one uh, I listed as number two is not uh, going to occur this evening. So. We have a presentation for the Apartments West. Yes, and uh, just for those that are here that aren't part of the presentations tonight, um, we're going to hear a few presentations before the public hearings on several of the pilot programs. So each, uh, each organization has uh, here tonight some representatives that will give a comprehensive but pithy uh, presentation <laughs> on each of the pilot requests. Oh, um, you know what? I know the two of you really well, so I'm going to ask you to pause for just a minute. We have someone who's going to get sworn in this, this evening, and I, I know they'd love to get that handled before. So you all just stay right there. We're going to have Amanda DeFries come up as a member of the South Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard Corridor Improvement Authority Board of Directors for a term to expire July 31st, 2021. Councilmember Spitzley. 
Thank you, Mr. President. So Amanda was here in development and planning earlier today. Um, she is the co-owner of 517 Coffee Company. I'm absolutely addicted to it. Um, coffee soda, people, coffee soda. It's amazing. Um, so she, um, she also, by day, works for a credit union, but we brought her on, and she's um, agreed to serve um, on the um, Martin Luther King Corridor. Um, there are business owners there. They've done great things um, in the corridor, um, and we're so pleased that she has offered to serve. Um, Councilmember Hussein, did you want to add anything with that? No, it, it was it was an absolutely great uh, interview as expected. Mm -hmm. um, we just appreciate the the fire, the passion, the excitement that you have for South Lansing. Um, obviously, your position on South MLK, but we know that your love mm -hmm. runs deep for the South Side and the things yes. that you and James and the other owners of 517 are doing right now. Um, and, and we talked about this, right? You guys made an investment um, in a difficult part of our community to make an investment in during a very difficult time. Um, and you guys are absolutely rocking over there. And so uh, appreciate what you've already done. Um, also appreciate the vision that you shared with us during that interview. Uh, and the fact that you really want to see that corridor move forward, that you want to see blight elimination, support a small business, uh, and the like. So I'm really, really excited um, about you. I'm bullish about this board. I think you guys are going to do great things, uh, particularly with the onboarding of the fellow. Um, and yeah, and I welcome. Yep. So with that, I'll um, move the motion. Move the resolution. Oh, there's a mo there is a proper motion before us. I see Councilmember Dunbar has her hand up. Councilmember Dunbar. Thank you. I think it was an eyebrow up. And I, yes, she but smiles was, at me. I did an eyebrow up. I just want to acknowledge that these guys started out, and if I'm correct, at the F South Lansing Farmer's Market. So this is an example of somebody that has basically incubated a business in a, an outdoor setting and then moved to brick and mortar to, to further their, um, their business. And I'm, I'm so proud of you guys. And I'm so glad that you chose to stay in South Lansing to do it. So kudos to you. Thank you very much. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. All those opposed, please say nay. Motion carries. Congratulations. The clerk will swear you in. Gentlemen, while they're signing the paperwork, we'll head and have you get started. So I apologize for the delay, but thank you for the indulgence. Mr. President, I, I hate to interrupt, but yes, can you move it closer? Make sure the green light's on. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Faith, could you uh, could you adjust the level on that mic, please? <laughs> Go ahead and give it a try. Is it better, anyone? Hold on, we got city TV. Yeah, we can't hear very well. Turn it up, yeah. She wants you to talk. Oh, yeah, just test. 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 Tell us a story. <laughs> I wonder if that one's better. Yeah, see if that one's better. Sorry. 
We had a big mic test this week, last week, and I don't know. That's not as good either. You want to come sit up here? <laughs> we have extra space today. Yeah. We found something. Oh, there we go. Somebody found a, uh, the right button. So, all right, again, I'm Doug Fleming. This is my partner, Sam Spadafore. Uh, I was on the uh, third page of the presentation where we start talking about who the partners are. Uh, the partners in this group is a, uh, a development group out of uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and Chicago, Illinois, called um, General Capital. And then Sam and myself make up the Community Advancement Advisors. We also have a third non-owner partner in the Lansing Housing Commission, which I think you all know um, that I'm a part of right now. So um, you can see the experience involved with uh, everybody involved. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, the involvement of, the, of all the parties I in, the, uh, in the deal. But what we're really looking at today is um, adding some affordable housing to the city. Uh, right now, there are about 50 affordable housing units with 4,800 low-income units, 27 housing units with voucher that need voucher assistance. Um, many of the affordable housing communities that we have in the city, as you all know, are very old and have not been modernized to meet resident needs. Um, a lot of it just because of lack of capital uh, in some of those organizations. And one of the things that we've been doing at the Lansing Housing Commission and other developers are trying to do is to invest more money into modernizing our affordable housing in the city. Uh, many ownership groups um, are not properly capitalized for future success. One of the things that we're going to do as part of this deal and what we've been doing with the, with the other development deals is to make sure that they are not only renovated but capitalized so that the long-term success of the building can be realized. Uh, right now in Lansing, um, there's about 24,000 households uh, in Lansing that are renters. Um, of those renting, 13,000 are considered to be overburdened. Overburdened under the government standards that you're paying more than 30% of your income towards your monthly rent. Um, the Lansing Housing Commission maintains a wait list of about 500 people for our Housing Choice Voucher Program. We just opened that list um, uh, about two weeks ago. It was open for seven days with no advertising, and we ended up with about 3,500 people signed up in seven days who all indicated a need for additional affordable housing in the city. Some of those do come from outside of the city, but I'm gonna say 90% of the people that signed up on the list are, um, have an address in and around the Lansing area. So there's still a tremendous need for affordable housing in the city. Um, again, services, uh, wait lists, often residents living in affordable housing need support for additional services, and we'll talk a little bit about that project. So Apartments West is a unique project um, in the sense that we are taking a currently unused project which is the uh, Old West Junior High School. We have a purchase agreement, uh, letter of intent with the, with the uh, Lansing School District to buy the building. Um, and what we're producing, this is building was constructed back in 1919. It has about 150,000 square feet. There's three uh, floors there. We have walked the building a couple of times. It's structurally sound, but it's in poor condition, and every year it deteriorates uh, further and further. So getting uh, the opportunity to develop this asset while it still has a chance, uh, we think is key to the overall success of the project and also to renovate a key asset to the city of Lansing. Um, it does have sig significant environmental risk. Um, it had coal as its heating, and there's other environmental things that were done back in 1919, as you all know, that are not allowed today. And as we do the renovation of the project, we have to mitigate those under uh, Mr. Rules. Um, we are under contract with the school, and they're in complete support of our effort to try to renovate uh, the school here. Uh, the conceptual layout is the next uh, slide. Um, we illustrate 51 one-bedroom units and 24 two-bedroom units. I think the other significant part about this is that we will have two areas of community space. Um, one will be the auditorium, and the other one will be the gymnasium. The intent at this point is to work with community groups, and I've already began to outreach to several different groups in terms of long-term use of these facilities. So these will be things that will be open. We've talked to the school, uh, for example, for the use of the auditorium for musicals and plays. Um, I've begun conversations, thanks to Council President Spadafore with the Lansing Symphony Orchestra about maybe this becoming the home for them. 
And then as far as the gymnasium, um, groups like the YMCA or other local athletic groups that may want to use it um, would be able to use it. You can see the unit mix in there on the first floor. Um, this would have a mix of units. Uh, there's 57 units here, though. Of the uh, units, total units available, 57 of the units will be between 60 and 80 percent uh, AMI. And that's basically uh, people that are working. Um, we're talking about people around $44,000, 50 to $44,000 uh, would qualify to live here. One of the key components to this is the partnership with the uh, LHC and our resident service programs. We'll have a memo of, of understanding with the development partners um, to provide uh, resident services. These are the same resident services that we already provide with our other partners um, that we've uh, been partnering with over the last couple of years. LHC does not have the funds to do all the development that we'd like to do, so one of the things that we've done to increase and improve affordable housing in the city and in terms of our long-term goal is to partner with other responsible developers and this is an attempt to do that um, with this group. Um, we have developed five pillars of uh, resident services at Lansing um, Housing Commission, health and wellness, supporting our residents as it relates to that, food security, financial education, educational development and employment skills. One of our philosophies is, is that one way to create new affordable housing in the city is to get lift people out of affordable housing and create a new unit for someone else to move in. And we really believe that these pillars, when uh, effectively uh, managed and implemented, can do that. And we have been working on this diligently for the last 12 months. I will tell you that COVID uh, has provided a, a, a tremendous challenge for us to do a lot of this stuff because of our inability to meet one-on-one -on -one or with groups. And our ongoing construction at Lansing Housing Commission has also prevented us from doing this. But we have plans going and we're going to continue to, to outreach and work with uh, a variety of different groups in the area. And we continue to outreach with those groups uh, to provide that, that kind of uh, interaction with these. These same services will be available um, to the residents of uh, the West Junior High project. Financial investment, we're talking about a $15 million capital project here. Um, in, in slide eight, um, high quality, safe, affordable housing. Um, this will be senior housing downtown uh, in kind of a neighborhood, but right on the edge of the corridor of the office um, neighborhood corridor. So it's a really great location. Um, there's a lot of mature trees. It's kind of quiet over there. Um, the good thing is, and we'll talk about in a minute, it generates new revenue stream for the city, even with the 4% pilot. Currently it's under the school, so it's not paying um, taxes and we will. Cost savings and risk reduction. The annual maintenance to the school district on this building is significant. I think the other thing that needs to be recognized that if the building is not renovated, um, there are estimates that just to tear the building down would be somewhere between a half a million, a million dollars, just because of the mitigation of, of the environmental uh, risk and things that would be necessary to take the building down. And you would also have the loss of a really significant historical asset here in the city. Um, we want to drive improvements by bringing the structure obviously back up to code. That's part of any development deal that you have to do. Has some local historical s significance. We want to maintain that. Uh, Malcolm X, Magic Johnson, some of the most noteworthy uh, former citizens of Lansing with the school there. Um, our intent is to kind of preserve that history and bring it back. Um, General Capital had a, a school that they did a renovation on in the back of this presentation we'll talk about in the first month and a half they had it open, they had about 800 people come through it. Most of them were just former students that wanted to walk back through their old school and see it again, which is kind of a neat thing to see when you renovate an old school. Uh, we're gonna create a, lay a site layout and pathways to support walking around the community so that people can get downtown, they're not that far from downtown, and then utilize some of the restaurants and other activities that will be available downtown. The development team evaluates the risks and needs of each product. I think the one thing I want to emphasize, and I know you have several pilots before you today and you have them in front of you on a pretty regular basis, is that each development deal kind of has its own DNA. That's the best way to describe it. Um, you know, everyone is a little bit different in what the needs are and what's going on with that particular development. We're only going to talk about ours here. And what we really did with this slide is to try to provide to you why 4% pilot here makes sense. Um, just as a point of reference, we're also working on another development deal on the corner of Cherry and Kalamazoo, which is right across the street from us, which will be the future home of the Lansing Housing Commission offices. And we're, we're not looking for, uh, we're, we're going to seek a 10% pilot by right pilot for that because that deal does not require 
on the same economics as this does. So even within ourselves, we have two deals that we're working on right now that will have um, two different requests based on the economics of the deal. So primarily, the pilot request is 4%. There's a high environmental risk here. When you're dealing with an old building, um, you don't know what you're going to get into until you get it. You know, it's the old story. You don't know what you know until you don't know. And we don't know what we don't know. And that's really what's going on here. So there is a very high environmental risk. We do some projections. You do have to do some preliminary environmental studies that will give us some indication of some of the work that needs to be done. But as you start tearing into stuff, you learn stuff. So there's an, an additional high environmental risk here. Construction cost risk is up significantly from a year ago. I don't think that's a secret to anybody that reads the newspaper or watches the news. So that is also added to the, the future of this project and doing the, the development. Long-term maintenance risk is also a little bit higher in an older building. Um, just because you're bringing it back up to code, it's still going to deteriorate faster than something that's brand new because you're not necessarily using new materials. So there's a little bit higher risk there. Other potential uses for the site, um, truthfully, they're very minimal. Uh, it takes a significant investment to, to use that. Uh, I think the building's been empty for 15 plus years, maybe longer than that. So if, if there was a lot of things that could be done with this building other than what we're proposing, I think it would have already been proposed by someone, um, probably people smarter than, than us. Uh, but we think this is a really good use of the, of the potential site and uh, maintenance of the asset. Uh, potential feasibility at a 10% pilot, um, it, it would not work very well at all. In fact, it probably won't work. So if we go to slide 10, uh, because I know this is always a question that this council wants to address, one of the things that causes you to have a pilot is that ultimately we have to get financials through MISTA. Uh, MISTA is the ultimate financing of all the deals, and, and they have financial standards they bought. One of them happens to be the debt service coverage ratio, and you can see as we, we go through the slide that under the, the debt service ranges, if you get above 1.4 debt service, uh, MISTA does not, you know, they won't underwrite deals. You get too high where you're having to spend too much money just paying down the debt. Um, and so what we've shown here is that under a 4% pilot, this would have about a 1.9 debt service ratio, which is right in the feasible risk area that MISTA likes. Not quite as conservative as they would like. They like it a little higher. Um, and they don't want it too high. So MISTA has a sweet spot in terms of the amount of debt that they want when they underwrite a deal. And so we've kind of tried to indicate that uh, from that 1.1 to 1.3. 10% pilot takes the, the, the uh, DSCR down to 1.05. It falls below a line that MISTA is willing to underwrite a deal at. They just don't like that much debt. They don't think that you, you're basically setting the project up for failure um, if you get your debt service uh, out of line there. Um, and the, on the right-hand side, we talk a little bit about um, the reduction of the construction budget would be likely of the 4% pilot. Um, if we go to a 6%, uh, we'd have a 6% reduction. So you're also talking about a lot less equity that comes into the deal when you start moving. So that's the other thing. If we're going to do some of the environmental mitigation and the other kind of construction needs that are needed in, an, in a historic building like this, you actually have to end up, uh, you, you reduce a lot of the equity that's available, which is part of your money that you use to do that. So um, the last part here that I wanted to point out is that we have examples of recently completed general capital group um, properties. This, uh, the first one is an independent senior community that's uh, 84, um, 40, 84 total, section 42 available market rate units. This is in uh, Muskegon, uh, Michigan downtown Muskegon. Um, it's a beautiful property that I've been by and seen a couple of times. The second one is probably the uh, most uh, uh, appropriate to what we're trying to do here. This is an old school in Berkshire, Sheboygan Falls, Wisconsin. Um, you can see some of the units, and this is really going to be typical of what we'll see there. When you go into a school renovation, one of the things that happens is you've got a bunch of odd-sized rooms. You know, you've got the old chemistry lab that's bigger than the regular English classroom. And so what our intent to do is to is leave the walls intact that are there to the extent that we can, and then you work around the existing structure to make units. So you're going to have some with some high ceilings. Some are going to be a little bit longer and narrow um, in, in that kind of situation. So it creates a situation where not even all the one bedrooms are exactly the same. They're all going to have kind of their own character to them depending on where they're located at in, in the building. There will be a lot of rooms, a lot of units that will be similar, very similar, because some of the classrooms are similar, but there's also going to be some that will be very unique. Um, then Berkshire Stevens Point, independent senior community as well. 
Um, that was a mixed use with some commercial space um, that they also built. You can see kind of the different type of uh, units that are available there as well. And then the last one is uh, Greenwich Park. Um, this is another uh, project that they did on the lakefront in, uh, in Milwaukee. So I want to be brief per President Spadafore's instructions, but I also want to make sure that we got all the information in. I do talk fast, but I'm welcome to answer any questions that the group has now on the presentation. Sure. Um, I've got Council Member Wood. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister Spadafore. Uh, thank you. A um, couple of questions. First of all, um, is there anyone from uh, the Lansing Housing Commission that's going to benefit from, as an individual, from this project? Individual person, you mean, or, yes. or a member, resident? No, an individual person that is part of the management team or yes. the board of directors. Yes, Ooh. I am a consultant with the Lansing Housing Commission. I'm not an employee, but I am part of the development team that's part of this. So will you continue to work as part of uh, the Housing Commission? Or yes. Will you, so you'd be handling both positions? Yes. All right. Um, I can remember at least four years ago, it might have been more than that, that we sat with members of the Housing Commission and part of the um, information that we heard when we were talking about South Washington was that it, uh, the idea of having a high rise um, and, and working from that perspective was outdated and something that shouldn't be done. So how do you put forth this concept based on that information, previous information? Well, I, I think the information on the high rise at, at Washington, first of all, it's five stories. Um, this is only three. Um, the, the second is, is that this is a senior building. One of my problems with the South Washington building, and I think I made those comments, is it's very difficult to manage a senior and family project together. And that was the difficulty of South Washington, which is why as we move through the RAD process down there, we have moved it to a senior preference building. So as the construction is completed, that will become a senior building as well. So this will be a senior building period? Yes. Okay. Um, one of the things that you had started, and I'm not sure where it is in play right now, was the Citizens Council. Is there going to be one in this development as well or not? The Citizens Council is a, a direct re representative of a HUD rule. The HUD provides money to each one of a any public housing. It's not even HUD, it's public housing. They provide money for citizens councils that want to form. So as it, as it relates to public housing, the Lansing Housing Commission has always allowed citizens councils at any of our properties where they wanted to form. In fact, we were very supportive of the one in South Washington, but the leadership has been unable to basically organize themselves uh, into that. We did a lot of supportive stuff for them, and they've not been able to follow through on actually getting themselves organized. So this is not a public housing, so it doesn't have a citizens council. If the citizens want to get together and have a resident group, like you can in any housing, they're, they're obviously allowed to do that. And then my last question is, based on some of the other Lansing Housing Commission sites, there were wraparound services that came and went. Um, and, you know, there were needs for those, but because there wasn't either adequate place to have them or um, other issues that were, were going on. So what is there, you talked about some of those when you, major presentation, what is the guarantee that they that they will continue? Well, the guarantee is only what I can say, and that is that as the executive director of the Lansing Housing Commission, I'm very passionate about that portion of it. And we have spent not only money, but time and effort in doing that. Even in the construction process, we are now adding to, for example, in South Washington, we're going to have a food processing area. So we have the gardens that we've started down there and expanded and our residents can go out and plant their food. And then in the fall, we are gonna have in the building itself when the construction's completed, 
um, commercial size freezers and their ability to go in and process their own food. We have Michigan State coming in to assist the residents uh, in doing that. That's just one example of the five pillars that we talked about. We have a literacy program that we're working on. Um, we're working with the city of Lansing. I spent about uh, 30 minutes on the phone the other day in support of Judy Keeler and working with them and the city in a, in a Bloomberg grant to provide literacy to our, to our children that live in the public housing department. And again, if you want me to spend time going through all we're doing in resident services, I would gladly do it. We just held two um, block parties, one at Leroy Fro and one at Hildebrandt in the last two weeks, uh, where we signed kids up for Head Start. We had this, this Lansing School District there where they could sign up for the Lansing School District. We had the de uh, de um, Ingham, Tower, Ingham County Department of Health there so they could sign up for um, insurance services or health services that they needed. Uh, we had the literacy uh, coalition there as well. We had our Dolly Parton people there. We got our 200th family to sign up for our literacy program that we're sponsoring through Dolly Parton uh, Foundation. And um, there was a variety of other groups that were there as well. So I, I can't tell you what's gonna happen beyond my leadership, Councilwoman uh, Wood, but I can tell you as long as I'm the head of the Lansing um, Housing Commission, we will have a robust resident service program and any development partner that we work with will also allow us to provide those same services. We get synergy when we have more people. If I go to Sparrow Hospital and say, I have 10 seniors for a senior program, that says something, but it doesn't say the same that I have 250 seniors at my disposal. And we can create a lot of different programming when we get bigger numbers and we can have the volume to do some of these things that we can do. And, and I appreciate your comments, but again, this, this pilot that we're looking at is either a 30 or 40 year pilot. So you're not gonna be here, I'm not gonna be here, but the repercussions of what this creates will be here. So that's why I'm asking some of these questions. And, and, I, and I appreciate that, and that's why I'm not gonna commit beyond my term as the executive director, so. Other questions? Councilmember Jackson. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for being here, Mr. Fleming. So on along the same lines, so is this is not a Lansing Housing Commission related project, not even capital, general capital group? That's not, re is that related to? No. Okay. Because I was just a little confused. I know that you're obviously the head of that. And when you mentioned some things, it was kind of like, almost like it was like a partnership. It is a partnership. There's just not an economic ownership on behalf of Lansing Housing Commission. We're also in partner with MVAH and the Stadium North project. Uh, both of those projects that are gonna be under construction here in the next uh, probably year, uh, Lansing Housing Commission has a similar partnership with them. We have a partnership with a group uh, in East Lansing where we're doing that. We actually have a partnership with Walter French. We're a part of the Walter French project as well. The vouchers that the Lansing Housing Commission provides has been the economic engine for a lot of the affordable housing here in the city. And I'm talking millions of dollars. I mean, ourselves, we're over 60 million. And if you add in the price of these other projects that we're a part of and that we're partnering with in, in a variety of different levels, we're talking about well over 150, 160 million dollars invested in the city relative to the different variety of partnerships that we have. The long-term intent of the Housing Commission is to improve the affordable housing in the city. We can't do that on our own. We're not, we're not by, by per se developers ourselves. So we partner with other groups in a variety of different partnerships. And each one of those partnerships that I just described have a little bit different terms in terms of what the partnership is. But the primary term is that the resident services that Councilwoman Wood just talked about is the cornerstone of us being able to provide those services there we also have some vouchers involved, and we're also going to be able to have some of our housing choice voucher folks be able to live there as well. Okay, thank you. That, that helped clear up a little bit, but I still have a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. So does the resident records follow someone from Lansing Housing Commission to this proposed affordable housing place? What records would you be speaking I don't know if they pay their rent on time, if they have a noise complaint, anything like that. Yes. Uh, every building that rents will all do a criminal and credit and a resident landlord background check. 
And so whatever, whatever is in your record goes any place that you're going to go rent. Sure, but that's a criminal record and your eviction history, pretty much. Well, there's still a landlord reference in there as well, and there's a, and there's a, a credit check that goes as well. Almost every, I don't know of anybody that does leasing that doesn't do those basic background checks. Sure, those were the basic ones, mm -hmm. but I asked, like, their resident records, like, if they have anything internal with Lansing no, Housing No, no. We, 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 the only thing that will be shared is anything that's public. Okay. Um, and for the other um, projects that you partnered in, mm -hmm. Lansing Housing Commission partnered in because you're interested in affordable housing throughout the city partnership. Correct. Um, but not like any money or ownership. Or did I mistake that? No, it, it, it depends. In uh, two of the deals, we have an ownership interest, and the other ones, we do not. Okay, so this one, you do not have? No. Okay. There We're, will be a financial interest, though, in that we have a memo, memorandum of understanding that they will be paying Lansing Housing Commission money for our resident services program. Okay. So, again, in response to Council Woman Wood, um, we're going to be generating income so that we can continue to provide these services. Okay. Okay. Um, and then were you, sorry to get like personal, but no, were fine. you partners, like project partners, where you possibly may benefit on any of those other projects? No. Okay. Um, is this, I guess, just because, I mean, you know, I, I want to support it, everything. So far sounds good-ish, but of course I want to talk to everybody else as well. But I just want to kind of get to like the bottom of, because I'm, I'm so used to seeing you with Lansing Housing Commission, and then like I'm trying to figure out if it's related and how much, and then that's all. So, I, get it. I understand, and, I, and, and that's one of our concerns too. And our board knows um, as we bring these projects to our board, we're very clear with everything that's going on, who the partners are, and what our financial relationships are with each one of these. We, we have extensive reports with each one of our boards on all of our different projects that we're involved in. And the uh, other partner uh, is, is it General Capital Development in Wisconsin? Yes, that's correct. Okay. They have eight current projects in the state of Michigan. And they knew you were the person to talk to to make something happen? <laughs> I get calls from developers every day, okay. um, sometimes two and three. This time of year, because of the tax credits, you know, the October round, um, every day. We met with a developer, Sam and I met with a developer this afternoon. Um, we are continuing to seek partnerships in a variety of different ways to increase and improve the affordable housing in the city of Lansing. We really see that as our ultimate mission. It's gonna come in a lot of different forms. Um, and this just happens to be one of those generations. And last part of the question. So are these all vouchers or is it like, do you talk about rent to us later? No, you never I talk, talk to, to you right that? now. These are not vouchers. The only vouchers that will be in this project will be the Lansing Housing Commission vouchers um, that we're gonna provide as a part of the tax credit application. Okay. I think there's nine. I think there's nine vouchers in this one. The rest of them will be it'll be affordable housing. So for a, example, a, a first year police officer will be able to live, a single police officer will be able to live in this building. And not they're, they're senior, but um, you know, that's where the levels are, the income levels are, but. Okay, I guess I gotta check what the exact yeah. definition is. It's probably a range though, but I Yes, it is. There's some 80% units, 60% units on down in terms of AMI. I have the numbers. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, that's that, fine. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you, I've got council member Spitzley and then council member Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. President, I have a couple questions. Um, will there be free Wi-Fi and air conditioning in these buildings? Yes, there will be air conditioning. I don't know about the Wi-Fi. I don't know if that's, uh, we've talked about that yet. Okay. Usually um, what we do in our buildings is that we have at least an area that there's free Wi-Fi. For example, in South Washington, down in our community room, we have free Wi-Fi. But you, you have, you, but you also, okay. Um, so you talked about your board. So your board knows um, the connection between this deal and what you're doing and they're okay with that? Well, we've talked to them about this deal and all the other deals as we present each month. We'll be presenting the updated details of this on Wednesday uh, when our board meets. Okay. Um, 
So management of, well, let me back up. This is, so when you say senior, is there a legal definition of senior? 55 and disabled. So a disabled person isn't necessarily a senior? Correct. Um, who's going to, one of the things that concerns me is, is always the management of these buildings after they're built. Um, you know, before your time, we had some management challenges, um, at the Lansing Housing Commission. So what's the management structure going to be for this one? We have talked to the developer and one of the other involvements of Lansing Housing Commission is that the current management company that is managing our properties and will manage our properties as we go through um, the RAD transition will also be the management company on this. So from a standards in terms of how we manage properties and how we'll be managing properties into the future, um, it will be LHC standards because it will be our management company. My final question is, how long, how long do you have to maintain it as senior and disabled? I think for the length of the contract, it's a 40-year affordability contract. Okay. All right. Thank you. I mean, you can petition, uh, just to be fair, I think you can petition to change that, but it would take HUD's agreement to be able to do that, and MISHTA. Councilmember Spitzley, all set. Councilmember Dunbar. Thank you. Um, I have so many. Um, one of the questions that Council Member Wood asked was about the services, and you had said that you can only guarantee them as long as you're involved in the project, as opposed to through the 40 years. Is there any way to write something into the agreement that says that those services will be provided as part of this since the abatement or the pilot would have last that long? I mean, that's. You know, we can look at that. Um, Councilwoman Dunbar and see what, what that would look like. We are gonna have an MOU, as I said, with them where they'll be paying money to the Lansing Housing Commission. So there is a financial benefit to the Lansing Housing Commission in this deal um, to support the services over there to offset some of our costs in providing those services. Uh, we can look at the length of the term of that with the developers. Is the MOU tied to the services alone? Yes. Okay. so. There is an incentive to continue that MOU to provide those services long term. Is there a way to codify that? It would be in the MOU itself. Okay, but that's, I guess that's what I'm asking is can we, can we do that to guarantee that there would be services provided there for them for the length of this pilot? Yeah, we can talk to the developers about that, our development partners, I should say. Okay, can we make that a contingency of approval if we need to? I don't know. Okay. Um. I'm not so sure Mishta would appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> it's better to do it off. Uh, I wouldn't even change the ordinance. Wouldn't make it conditional, but we'd have to have some assurance, it sounds like, from council. Yeah, yeah, I would say it cannot be done within the pilot, Councilman Dunmore. Mishta does not allow any, any contingencies in the pilot. In fact, one of your groups that are coming behind you or it's coming behind you because of a contingency and a pilot that Mishta did not like. Okay. So Mishta wants the pilot to be free and clear and you can have side agreements as it relates to, for example, Davis-Bacon or in this case, the MOU related to resident services. Okay. What is the length of time for the MOU that you're considering right now? Um, we hadn't really talked about years. We just talked about the amounts and what we wanted to be able to do. So. Um, you know, we're just we're still trying to put together the last parts of the deal and these were some of the last negotiations that we had okay um it what is the memorandum of understanding for your services because i was uh, was listening to council member jackson say that because that was one of my questions was of all the other organizations or locations that you have partnerships like walter french um and you, you were saying that the, the Lansing Housing Commission, you know, in that partnership might receive funding or be responsible for providing services or what have you, but you are not particularly involved the way that you are in this deal. 
Well, we are in some of them. Um, it depends. We have agreements with some of the developers that they will allow Lansing Housing Commission to come on property. That We're not always getting financially remunerated under an MOU, but we have agreements with them that we can come on and provide services that will have full access to all the residents there and promotion of all of our services and our resident you know, service coordinator people that we have hired uh, at Lansing Housing Commission will have access to the residents there. Okay. So it's Thank you for clarifying that. Now, with regard to the remuneration that you receive on this project, you do, do you receive that type of remuneration on other projects that you have partnered with? Because we, I keep hearing we and I, and I think that, I mean, that's confusing for us up here to know what part of it is the um, partnership between the Lansing Housing Commission in this and then your role separate from that. We get remuneration in a variety of ways. The Stadium North project, we're getting remuneration um, as being a, a partial owner. They were open to us doing that. So we have an agreement with them to provide resident services. That cost is being offset by uh, a small ownership stake instead of an MOU related to resident services. Every developer wants to do it a little bit different. Um, this deal, the way we ended up talking about, you know, getting some financial remuneration back to Lansing Housing Commission was through the memorandum of understanding. But it, the money flows differently depending on the different deals. Right, but what, what, what I was hearing is that you get calls, you get calls from mm -hmm. developers yes. up to twice a day. Yes. And that you are involved in these developments. So I'm, I'm speaking specifically to the amount of money that you receive personally as a consultant to this project as opposed to money that's going to the Lansing Housing Commission for the partnership. Okay. What do you want to know the difference about? Like I how, much, how much am I going to get as a part of this deal versus how much Lansing Housing Commission is going to yeah. get? Um, the total on the Lansing Housing Commission, because we did talk about for the full length of the, of the deal, although we've not settled on it, would be, um, we talked about $10,000 a year times 40 years, which would be about $400,000. And then how much do you receive for your part in this partnership? I think it's $150,000 split between the two of us. Okay. Um, I'm going to go into a realm. I'm going to chew on that for a minute. Um, I'm going to go into the physical logistics of this project. So this is a senior and disabled project. And um, I also had concerns, and I'm glad that Councilmember Wood brought them up about the three levels. And I appreciate your description that um, that was a family and senior um, complex over at South Washington. Um, but one of the problems that we had there was the conflict happening near the elevator. Um, and the issues with security because of the exterior entrances and so it was limited to a single entrance. We have, what I can see on this drawing is five separate points of entry in downtown Lansing. What will you do for security in those regards? Like how, and, and I guess the other thing that, to go with that is since this is senior and disabled, there is one single elevator in this entire building and the building is set up in three wings. Um, so how I, I anticipate a lot of congestion for folks that are disabled or senior and have mobility issues trying to use the stairs versus the elevators. Was there any thought to putting in an additional elevator or anything to help with, help with that? I will make a note of that and talk to the designers. Okay, when will this come back to us? Process, 9th of September. Okay. It's got to go to development and planning. Let's go back to DMP and then. Okay. So I would ask everybody that's on development planning to please like follow up on this because I'm definitely making notes and we'll follow up on it. I think that it's it's important to consider the security aspect of having five points of entry downtown, and 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 really having a good security system for that, and an additional elevator or two, um, and I know that those are an expense, but. Um, From a security standpoint, all the doors will be secured with a, 
you know, a fob of some sort that only the residents can get in. Most of the problem at South Washington was a result of residents letting in people, um, not the security system. Um, we have added additional security down there and additional cameras to address that need at South Washington and eliminated that problem significantly. Um, but the problem down there was not about the secure doors. It was about residents letting people in when they shouldn't be. Okay. Okay. Then I would, I would, I would definitely ask for the additional elevator space. Mm -hmm. um, and then the final question is the vouchers versus and then the affordable. What, what do you consider? I don't, I don't know that I saw an amount in here. What is going to be considered affordable? Um, I know you mentioned the income level that they would serve. Um, right. But what would what is what are the rents that we're we're talking 57 about? Fifty-seven of the units, um, of the total units, are going to be um, either sixty or eighty percent AMI. A uh, one person making sixty percent AMI in Ingham County today is around thirty-three thousand dollars. A two-person, a couple, would be around forty-four thousand dollars. They would qualify to live there as a senior. Two-person. Um, that's one person. Two person at 60%, it goes to $37,000, and it goes up to $50,000 and 80% AMI. We also have some 30% units in here as well, which is required by MISHTA to serve the, the very, very low income as well. Okay, and how much will those units cost? That's where I'm getting. I, I, I get well, you want to know what the rents are? Yes. Um, yeah, I don't know what they are off the top of my head, but we can get them to you. So. The rents are limited by the income as well. Mishta ties it to 30%. So they won't overburden you. So they have income limits based on, on these numbers as well. Okay, well, I, I would, again, I would urge the committee when you guys take this up to, because um, I would like to know before we, we vote on this what we anticipate the rents will be. Um, because it's, I, I obviously know, I mean, when we talk about overburdened, we're anticipating that rent can be no more than 30% of, of income. Um, but if I'm looking at these numbers, I mean, to have rent be 30% of however many thousands of dollars that folks make, that's a, still a high rent for an annual rent. So I was just trying to not have to extrapolate from AMI what, um, what the possibility for rents will be. Do you think that by the time we bring this back to council in September that you we would have an idea what those rents would be? Yeah, the rents are already published. Okay. All right. Um, and that's it. Thank you, Councilmember Dunbar. Any questions further? No, okay. Well, just very, very quick because I know Council Councilman Spadafore has a trip to make. But um, with regards, I, I, I am really, really obviously Outed. keen on the idea of um, appropriate, affordable housing for seniors. We, I mean, we have to do a better job of making sure that our senior populations can age in place with grace. Um, that said, I, I still want to drill down a little bit on the definition of senior. So we have 55 disabled. When you're talking as an example, two bedrooms, if I'm a 25-year-old kid and I have my 65-year-old mother living with me, am I able to move in? Who's disabled? I, but because I have the senior, am I able to move in, the 65-year-old? I don't believe so. My, my point I gotta is, check I, that I, out, somebody I alluded know. to the fact during DMP that, and, and, and maybe, I, maybe I understood it wrong, but that a senior could move in somebody that is not a senior with them if it's a family member. Is that correct or not? I don't believe that to be correct, but I will get that verified. Okay, please do. Unless they're disabled. Unless they're disabled. Yes. So if I'm a senior and I have a disabled um, child, you know, even if the child's 40 years old, sure. they, can, they can move in as a disabled person. Okay. But an um, able-bodied person, I do not believe, can move in. Okay, before I proceed, go ahead. But the, but the disabled person can be under 55, yeah. right? Correct. Okay. okay. All right, I appreciate that. I want to make sure I have these numbers right. So it is, it, it's estimated based on um, the investment that property taxes without a pilot would be 96000 a year, correct? With the pilot, we're looking at 25000 a year. So over a 40-year period, we're looking at almost $2.9 million. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, 2.9 million. Okay. And then I want to um, very quickly, um, because we're looking at a number of pilots today, um, so this is the last thing I'll say, mm -hmm. um, I promise, um, is that there, there are some, there's, we always hear these comments how we need more affordable housing in the city of Lansing. Um, 
I'm, I'm not going to argue that point, but what we have to be very clear on is we need more appropriate affordable housing. And so I would challenge um, the folks that are before us today, uh, as you look to carry out your respective missions, the mission of the LAC, um, that you look at potentially acquiring properties that are existing today in some of our, our most vulnerable communities, because what we're doing is we're adding two. Um, I know that there's this theory, I've never seen it work, um, because we've been approving pilots for a very long time here in the city of Lansing and it has not worked. Um, but there's this theory that uh, if you build over here and it's appropriate, that's gonna force their hand to actually invest in their properties and that's gonna become appropriate. And that is absolutely not what has happened in the city of Lansing. Um, so whether you look at Woodside, Summer Place, Waverly Park, Leroy Fro, with all due respect, South Washington, Stonecrest, I mean, the list goes on and on. I live in these properties. Um, it, there's very, very little appropriate affordable housing when you're talking about multifamily properties. Um, and, and most came, we have a shiny ball syndrome kind of deal uh, here uh, in the city of Lansing. Most came with the exact same presentations that we're gonna see today. Uh, and unfortunately, um, because folks aren't using their R&Rs correctly, they're not investing in the properties correctly, they're not truly being good stewards of this partnership that they have with the city of Lansing and us bypassing millions and millions and millions of dollars in, in revenues. Um, and, and candidly, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear, you know, the mayor at some point weigh in. We have a very, very difficult time with the few code officers that we have getting in there, inspecting in a real way to ensure that these people are not being preyed upon by developers, out of town developers, management companies, folks that are making a heck of a lot of money with all due respect uh, off of these deals. There's a lot of money in poverty. We say that often. Um, and, and, and then the other piece is we have to also be cognizant of the fact that every study shows that we need more affordable housing in the region. 20,000 over 20 years in the Tri-County region. Mm -hmm. And so we have to do a better job with our municipal partners ensuring it. It's a very antiquated model. It's never worked, right? That we're gonna warehouse all the poverty in the city center and, and we're gonna help those people ascend and all that's resulted in is generational poverty. So we have to do a better job working with our municipal, municipal partners, making sure that, you know, if, if I'm poor, I grew up in HUD housing. If I'm poor, I might wanna live in East Lansing. I might wanna live in Oakwood. I might wanna live in Hazlitt, but it's all in Lansing. We depress the, and, and we all know this, we depress the area median income so low that all we can get is check cashing and liquor stores. And, and so we have to do things differently. So when I see four pilots in front of us um, for 40 years at four, you know, four percent, it, it makes me nervous, particularly when we're looking at antiquated three, four, five, three, that's to me, that's a high rise when we're talking about housing. Three stories, seniors, five points of access, downtown and, and with all the res respect we've got regards to south washington carol wood and myself saw it um when you talk about you know it was residents doing this and that there was some of that going on some of it was also the fact that you had a senior with a walker going into right their home and then five kids waiting for that person to open the door and boom they're in right and and what happened sometimes we had these people kicking in front doors sometimes we had these people accosting seniors robbing seniors uh, so there was a lot of that too uh, but i just challenge folks to to think about things differently maybe do things a little bit differently so we can truly meet the need um, and truly help people ascend from their circumstances thank you well I, I i will respond this way one i have changed south washington because of that concern that you identified our resident service program is dedicated to lifting people out of poverty so when you say do it a different way I would make the argument very strongly that that's exactly what Lansing Housing Commission is trying to do right now. We partnered with a group to uh, start some units in East Lansing on Grand River Avenue over by the Whole Foods. We're a partner in that, in that deal over there. So in terms of regionalism, we're also working on that as well. So I agree with you. Everything that you said is absolutely correct. But I would also argue that, that that's exactly what we've been doing since my administration started. Uh, at the Lansing Housing Commission is to look at it differently and to stop generational uh, poverty and to find ways to move beyond that. And one of the first things that we identified was making an investment through RAD and through the low income tax credit to first lift people up emotionally that I don't live in a dump and that I live in a really nice housing, uh, you know, building. And then once you lift them up from that perspective, what we've seen, and I've been involved in a lot of development deals, is that people start acting differently. Um, they take care of their homes because they feel like someone else feels that th I'm worthy, and then they feel worthy about their house. You combine that with the resident services that we're providing, and I think we have a model to move forward and to change some of the things that you identified. And you know, the first thing was, I agreed with you. My 
my very first inclination when I saw South Washington was whose ever idea that was to put that into a family situation didn't know what the heck they were doing as it, as it relates to management. And most of the things that you identified, Councilman Hussein, are management issues. Affordable housing and market rate housing are not any different. It's just how they're managed. If you manage crappy market rate housing, you're gonna have crappy results. If you manage crappy affordable housing, you're gonna have bad results. And so what this group has to live with is that you're making a long-term arrangement in the groups that you're working with and their ability to manage that property on a long-term basis under quality standards that's good for not only the residents, but also good for the neighborhood and for the city uh, as a whole. And that's a difficult decision. I don't wish that on anybody because really asking you to look into the future for the next 40 years, and that's hard to do. All I can say is that Lansing Housing Commission is a local group. Sam and I are local. He's born and raised in Lansing. I've lived here for 30 years my, myself, and that we have shown, I think, in the last four years, a dedication to do just that. So, and that's all, we, that's all we can say. We can't make promises for 40 years. We can just tell you what our, what our history is and what we're attempting to do. Okay, I think we're good. Uh, I appreciate the questions from the council members. Uh, most of my questions have been answered. Mr. Flying, Mr. Spada, for my nearly seven years on the school board, I pushed really hard to get that building sold, developed something like this to happen. So I'm excited to hear more about the project. I know the committee's got some work to do and some questions that are left unanswered this evening, but I'm very excited to see that crumbling building I've walked through several times and, and had the vision of that could be something great or we're tearing it down kind of, kind of thing. And I'd love to see that preservation happen, particularly in housing for seniors in our community so that they can be part of downtown's forward motion that's been set in place by so many other projects as well. I'll do also, and just state for the record, Mr. Spadafor and I do share a last name, but the city attorney has uh, assured me that our, our relationship is, there's no conflict on this setting. So I just wanted to put that out there on the record for you all, but thank you all for being here this evening. Um, President Spadafor, yeah. so a lot of council members had a lot of questions. My suggestion is to send those in an email to Sherry. So yes, we can that's a great those, idea. If you yeah, do have questions. Refer those then back to those folks so that we can have those answers yep. when we do committee. Yeah, there was a lot of questions. So questions that you want answered for committee, please do that so uh, Sherry can get that out to the rest of the folks. Yes. I said that I was gonna chew on it and I'm still chewing on it. And I'm sorry, I gotta, I gotta say this. I am, I'm wondering why this couldn't have been done in your role as the director of the Lansing Housing Commission since it's a partnership with the Lansing Housing Commission. And you just said to me that you guys are gonna be splitting 150,000, I mean, making $75,000 as a side gig to do this, you're making more money on a side gig than you are anybody that can live in that place. And that's, I, I'm concerned about that, that, that that's how this negotiation went down. And I guess if, if you wanna give me something to allay it or just hold it and take it into committee and discuss it in committee, but it is, it's really concerning to me that this is a partnership entered into by the Lansing Housing Commission with the expertise of the Lansing Housing Commission, but the director of the Lansing Housing Commission is making money off the partnership independently of the Lansing Housing Commission. Well, I came to the Lansing Housing Commission as a development consultant and management consultant. I've never left that role. I am continue to be a consultant. The agreement with my board of directors is that I am a consultant and that while I work part-time for the Lansing Housing Commission, I also have several other jobs and other development deals that I am actively involved in and have actively involved in. So this is really no different than the way I've been acting for the last three or four years. It just happens to be a deal in the city of Lansing where a lot of my deals are outside of the city of Lansing. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And our next presentation is the Walter French pilot. Oh, you're back. Mr. Van Fossen. Welcome back. This project should sound familiar to everyone around this table, and I'm sure that we'll hear a little bit of why, what brings us together on this issue. So Mr. Van Fossen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President and the rest of the body, Mayor Shore. Um, I'm Raleigh Van Fossen, the Executive Director at Capital Area Housing Partnership, and joining with me is our project consultant, Mickey Drosty. 
Um, hopefully you all remember just about eight, nine months ago, we had this pilot presentation before you where this body um, did approve a 6% pilot request at 20 years. I just wanna clarify that. A couple comments were made that all of them tonight are fours at 40. We were a six at 20 and that is not changing. Um, sadly though, we are coming back after a failed LIHTC application to the State Housing Authority due to our pilot language. Um, sadly, if this language was the different route that we're hoping to propose tonight, we would have been funded this past July. So we're eager to get these changes before you and go forward with an October 1 application. I am just gonna give a couple highlights of the project, mainly for those watching at home, but even a refresher for those um, here in the audience and the rest of you. Um, the Walter French School came before the housing partnership in December of 2017. Not to interrupt, uh, but Mickey or uh, Raleigh, oh. there is a clicker in front of you that should alert, alert City TV when you wanna advance the slides, so. I would say click, like green. It takes a minute. Do, do, do. Well, I'll keep talking and I, Click. Oh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> the Walter French building came before us in 2017. I'm gonna flip through some of these. Um, after a failed demolition permit request by the prior owner, um, the city of Lansing mayor at that time in the development office denied the demolition permit to preserve the nationally historic registered building that's there today. Um, after that permit denial, um, the city came to Capital Area Housing Partnership. Um, they saw our recent success with the old Bailey School in downtown East Lansing and brought us forward to see if we could pursue um, some sort of renovation to bring some sort of housing and commercial space to the project. So what we're working on today is a 76 unit, one, two, and three bedrooms. We're adding the three bedrooms largely in part of conversations we've had with our resettlement partners at St. Vincent Catholic Charities and the Refugee Development Center at the lack of quality three bedroom apartments available. So you see those incorporated into our site plan. Additionally, within this is the set aside of units preserved for those that in Mishta's terms, they refer to as permanent supportive housing. What's, why that's important is that's qualifying and serving the most vulnerable households in our community and adults. Those are folks who are either street homeless today, may have suffered from some sort of mental health disability and require a level of support surface, services beyond what your traditional property management company would offer or even your ownership. And so for this project, that means we've partnered with the local Ingham County Continuum of Care. That includes identifying um, CMH, Community Mental Health, Advent House Ministries, I'm trying to flip through the partnerships, as well as Holy Cross Services to deliver those on-site services specific to those PSH units. Um, that's more of a handholding than you would get from an office manager. That's somebody who's physically visiting with those residents on a weekly basis, working through those life skills um, that those units and those residents may need. Additional partnerships include partnering with this city and the development office and investing some of our CDBG dollars that we as a community receive in order to make this project whole, as well as partnering with the Lansing Board Water and Light to do a pilot on-site generation for the energy production that this building would qualify for. I'm gonna pass the mic though to Mickey. She's gonna explain specifically the pilot language changes that's being brought before, and then certainly would take any questions. Thank you, Raleigh. Good evening, all. Um, I, I just wanted to give a really quick what's different about the pilot that we're asking for in language today versus what was executed um, in December. And the first and foremost, Misha objected to um, a non-related default language that was put into the first one, or in words that were talked about earlier tonight, conditions in the pilot. They don't want pilots that have conditions in them so that if for any reason other than the language in the pilot that has to do with payment, something happens, the pilot then goes into default. So we had to remove the default language that was in there. Two other things that happened is Mishta reviewed it and asked us to further clarify the definition of the mortgage financing that says what mortgage um, and financing allows for pilots or requires pilots. Um, so that was modified and I believe Mr. Abood asked for the increased language around construction start date so it wasn't just kind of lingering out there. So our pilot now states that construction must begin within a two year period of time in order for the pilot to remain in effect. 
I'll just add that could, Mishta's legal could has- Could you repeat the last thing that you said? I heard someone that didn't hear that. Yeah, the, the pilot now requires that um, construction begin within a two year period of time of the ordinance execution. And then Thank I was you. just gonna close out by saying, um, because this was the area of the application that did not get points, which did not allow the project to proceed forward, um, we have received approval, I think, from the city attorney's office that this language meets the city's definition of requirements, as well as the state housing authority. So hopefully with passage of this pilot, we will be on our way to the October 1 application and not see Mishta poke at this again. I tried to give a brief overview, but I can go back to any of the slides. Any questions from council? I think you answered most of our questions in December, so I appreciate you for coming down. Um, this will go back to DMP and then come back to us on the 13th of September. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presentation is the Cedar Place pilot. Welcome, if you could please introduce yourselves. I think the clicker is there if you need that this evening. Um, sure. Welcome to Lansing City Council. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm Scott Fry. I'm uh, Sorry to manager. interrupt, we are having trouble hearing. So if you could pull the mics closer when you're speaking, we appreciate it. Is that better? That's much better, thank you. Thanks. I'm Scott Fry, I represent Jonathan Rose Companies and I have with me uh, Kevin McKee, who's the president of our management company, Rose Community Management. Um, First, I'd like to thank the Development and Planning Committee for the time that they've given to this project, and it's uh, my pleasure to be here before the council tonight. Um, Jonathan Rose Companies is a mission-driven owner and developer who is focused on the creation and preservation of affordable housing, uh, including Cedar Place, one of our 16 Michigan properties. Cedar was developed in 1974 under Section 236 which created affordability by restricting rents and providing an interest rate subsidy to the owners. Prior ownership opted out of Section 236 and Cedar Place became unrestricted, operating as a naturally occurring affordable housing property until 2019 when Rose succeeded in bringing 94 units of project-based Section 8 to Cedar Place. Through the complex transfer and combination of two HAP contracts through a Section 8 BB transfer, from a property in Rochester Hills, where the owners were opting out of the Section 8 program and taking their property to market rate. This action preserved 94 units of affordable housing in Michigan and brought it to Lansing. The process took two years and cost over $300,000 in legal and consulting fees and necessitated over $250,000 in improvements required by HUD, including new Sir, cabinets. Sorry to interrupt again. Uh, your, your tone is a bit too dulcet. If you could speak up just a little bit, we're having trouble hearing folks up here. Sure. Thank you. Uh, our action in bringing the 94 units of affordable housing uh, to Lansing uh, took two years, cost over $300,000 in legal and consulting fees, and necessitated over $250,000 in improvements uh, required by HUD, which included new cabinets, countertops and vanities in 59 units, as well as tens of thousands more and other improvements uh, required as a condition for approval of the transfer request. Uh, we request that the council advance our proposal for a 4% pilot at Cedar Place contingent upon Rose receiving an allocation of tax credits, which will allow us to compete, complete the next phase of the preservation effort at Cedar Place, which would be a coordinated renovation of the property. In completing the proposed renovation, Rose would restrict all or as many of the units as possible at 60% of AMI and below without displacing any of the existing residents. Most importantly, the transaction would create an additional 126 units of deed-restricted affordable housing in Lansing, where half of renters are considered overburdened, paying in excess of 30% of their incomes in rent, and also bring the property up to the strict standards upheld by Rose Companies and deliver an appealing product that our residents and the entire city of Lansing can take pride in. The pilot is essential for two reasons. First, it is part of MISHTA's QAP scoring table. The competitive 9% percent 
LIHTC program awards points for projects with tax exemptions, which shows community support and the community's desire to leverage our investment in the city's affordable housing stock. Our project will need these points to be competitive with the other applicants in the state. Secondly, the reduction in operating expenses will allow us to increase loan proceeds, which translates into additional funds available for renovation. If awarded an allocation of 9% tax credits, affordability would be guaranteed for at least 45 years. Rose has been a good steward of Cedar Place since taking control in 2017 and beginning to plan for its redevelopment. The owners have contributed in excess of $1.5 million to fund the HAP transfer, unit upgrades, capital repairs, and operating cash shortfalls. Most recently, ownership funded the $150,000 replacement of the building's chiller without hesitation when it would not hold pressure upon startup this spring. The property has many other capital needs, and a tax credit renovation is key to accomplishing the goal of securing this essential housing in the city of Lansing. We have valued the opportunity to speak with several council members prior to today's meeting. Uh, we have listened carefully to your feedback, and we are committed to working in partnership with you to ensure that this project delivers the most value to the city of Lansing and to the residents of Cedar Place. Thank you for your time and consideration, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Good, okay. I see hands from Council Member Dunbar and Wood. Thank you for that presentation. I heard you say that you are going to keep all of the residents that are there and you're gonna be moving toward um, dedicating 60% AMI and below for some of the units. I um, received a couple of communications from folks who live there currently who received um, announcements, I don't know if that was email, mail, slipped under the door, what, um, that their rent was going up 25% starting January 1st. That's, were these? Um, the rent, I can, I can tell you. Um, it went, the, said the current rent is 559, and that's starting on January 1st, it's going up to 703. So subtracting the two and dividing, it's 25% difference. Um, can so, you speak to that? Because I mean, obviously we're doing this to keep the, we want it to be affordable and we want it to, folks to stay there. Um, and we certainly don't want to displace the folks that are there, but um, it's hard to swallow. Like, I know that you want capital to do the improvements, but if there's already been a plan to raise the rents on the folks that are there, I mean, we've got to consider that too. So our, our, our HAP contract, uh, as all HAP contracts do, receives an OCAF uh, annually, which is a small adjustment to uh, rents to keep up with uh, increased operating expenses. Um, the HAP contract rents were increased to $703. Um, and I just think it's important to point out that a new 60% AMI unit in Ingham County would rent for $890. So our, our rents are even today are even more affordable than a 60% AMI unit would be. Just just to follow up on that, ma'am, is the, on that half contract, the 30% of adjusted gross income rents that the residents are paying will not change. They'll pay 30%. The half contract amounts that are paid with us in HUD, that contracted amount, does not impact their rent. We have to provide that to them because of the changes in the contract, but that's not gonna impact their specific rental payment every month. That's so, going to be based on their income. So are you saying that the, help me understand that. So is her rent so, not changing or is it changing at a smaller amount? Correct, so they're, they would still maintain a 30% of adjusted gross income rent. That's based on their income. So that will not change. Okay. HUD is, is just increasing our overall rent uh, contract. So that, that comes into place every, every five or so years. Um, as we as we get those rent adjustments from the uh, from HUD, okay. but the individual so this so she makes less than a certain amount and her thirty percent is less than that seven oh three her rent would be the, so whatever she, that if she paid five hundred dollars and there's been no change to her income she paid five hundred dollars on January first there'd be no change 
Okay, I think I would suggest, since we've gotten the calls, because yep. I think maybe people are confused or and they're scared, because um, they don't, I mean, especially those who have lived there for any length of time, yep. the idea of having to move out because of that drastic, um, an increase in their rent. Maybe you could do some type of outreach or a communication to, to clarify that, because I know that I'd let her know as soon as I heard that you guys were on the agenda that I was gonna ask this question and I wanted to get back with her. But um, rather than me mistranslate, I would, I would like to be able to follow up with her. So could you give me a time frame in which you would do that outreach so that I can, I'll tell her, let's talk after you guys hear from management again. Yeah, we should be able to get that out this week. Okay. So we'll move quickly on that. Right. And we can provide a copy to you of what we send out so you have a, you understand what we sent and what we're trying to communicate and we'll, we'll definitely clarify that. And if, That's they, great. if they have additional questions, we'd be happy to take that in the office if they're comfortable there or over the phone, just to make sure. We, we obviously don't want to create an environment where they're uh, uncertain about their future. So That's we'll make a good uh, corrective action yeah. there. Yeah, thank you for that. Yep. Y'all set, Councilmember Dumber? I'm done. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Wood? Thank you. Um, how long have you owned this particular property? Rose Companies has been the general partner in Cedar Place since 2017. 2017. So between 2017 and today, how much have you invested? Over $1.5 million. And how much of that was needed repair versus upgrade? The such upgrades as the that boiler we, going out, such as you know, I mean, where you had to make the repair versus the fact that you went in there and upgraded a unit because somebody left. So um, to bring the HAP contract over, we upgraded 59 units at a cost of uh, roughly two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. The remaining um, r money was spent to, um, to to keep up with the um, capital needs of the project to keep it running, chillers, um, and, and other mechanical issues. And when you purchased this property, did it have a pilot? No, it did not. So you are currently do not have a pilot on this? Correct. Can I ask you, when you're looking at a 9% versus a 10%, why, are, why the difference? Or am I wrong that you're not asking for a nine? We are asking for four. For four. We're applying in Mishta's 9% uh, tax credit round, which uh, has okay. a, an application date of That's, October 1st. I, obviously, I misunderstood when you said that. Um, and this building um, is not predominantly senior, is that correct? I believe that it, it, so it's not restricted formally as a senior building, but I believe that we have a large contingent of senior, uh, senior residents, and a lot of that is just a factor of the income limits on the HAP contract and holdovers from um, the Section 236 days. So your pilot won't restrict it to seniors, is that what I'm hearing? The pilot would not uh, place an age restriction on the building. All right, thank you. Um, and then, and Jim, um, for, for a legal question, and that is, um, in talking about some of the side agreements, um, what is the enforceability of having side agreements? Or Joe, I don't care which one of you answer. Thank you, Council Member Wood. Uh, we have a we have a, uh, a direction from the administration that we want prevailing wage Davis Bacon agreements, and so we enter into a side agreement uh, with uh, the developers for the <coughs> excuse me for the prevailing wage Davis Bacon language. And we can enforce that. That's a separate agreement. <coughs> Excuse me. It's just like a contract, and it's enforceable on its own terms. 
But it would not, if, if I'm correct in remembering with HUD, it won't allow us to withdraw yeah. the pilot. Uh, actually, <clears throat> uh, the pilot, the mortgage, is a separate agreement with the developer, but the pilot, uh, the council can always, it's an ordinance. So okay. if they do like not, if they do not follow the agreement, we can repeal the ordinance. Okay, that's the first I, you know, because I've heard before that we couldn't do that. So you're, you believe we can. This is an agreement that's enforceable between the city and the developers. The, the, the ordinance, the pilot. The, the, the Davis Bacon side agreement that correct. we have that's correct but, but you just said that the ordinance could be repealed yes we can repeal it's the city's ordinance so it can be repealed if they if they do not follow uh do not pay the the uh different the rents uh don't comply with it don't commence within two years uh any of those things can result in the termination of this ordinance okay thank you Maybe I should clarify that Kurt, a prior statement had to do with putting conditions in the ordinance itself. Okay, all right. I have Council Member Spitzley, then Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, that last statement was kind of incredible because if that was the case, I'd have moved to yank the Porter's pilot a long time ago. Yeah. But I thought that we were not able to do that, and so. That, that right there, that was, that was something new. Because um, I, 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 I would have moved to um, repeal that, that um, pilot at the Porter a long time ago. Um, I have a question. So you talked about um, expending $300,000 to move, um, was it to move the 94 Section 8 units into Lansing? That's correct. We took uh, two HAP contracts from two projects um, that were called Northridge in Rochester Hills um, and combined them and, and brought them to Cedar Place and installed the, it, the budget authority under the, that combin, combination of two HAP contracts was enough to, uh, to uh, add 94 right. units at Cedar Place. I appreciate that. Is that part of the 1.5 million you mentioned to Council Member Wood as it was. investments? Yes. Okay. Um, what about, so the demographics of the building, you have seniors, families, single in the building at this point. And, 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 and full disclosure, and you know we've talked about this, is that we, we are hearing um, that there's some um, friction with those demographics in the buildings. Um, and and, and, and we, I had asked you, was it feasible to put the demographics on different floors so they wouldn't interact? And we, we understood that that probably wasn't feasible. So I'm just, I'm just kind of throwing it out that um, we, have, we have had some concerns of, about that because you have that mixture there. And that's why I, I promised to bring uh, Mr. McKee who could uh, expound on some of our, our policies. Okay. So, so, just, oh. so just generally speaking, there's, there's no restrictions in terms of age or composition. So we have a wide variety of resident types at the property. So I, I think that's just based on who applies mm -hmm. and then who qualifies. All right, thank you. And then my final question for legal is, um, I get the, the side agreement for um, prevailing wage. Um, but I'm going to ask again, because I think I've asked before, do we have the capability to enter into side agreements for other issues besides the two-year um, limitation to start up and some other things? And so if, if there is a management issue, for example, or, you know, multiple code enforcement um, issues, for example, legally does council, I mean, you know, and, and we move to repeal an ordinance. 
because of those things. I, I have to clarify, <clears throat> not clarify, just amplify what was said before. The, you just can't repeal the ordinance. There has to be a, a, a breach of the contract. Okay. And then in the breach of the contract, there has to be a language that says basically a default. What does the current language say now, Joe? Like prevailing wage or things of that nature. And then that would could trigger repeal. So it's so not we just could, an I, arbitrary. I, and I appreciate that. So we so there is the opportunity then to enter into side contracts that list certain things that the city of Lansing would expect them to do and if they do not fulfill those contracts yeah. then we could move to repeal the ordinance yeah. is it in the con yeah go ahead joe just like the prevailing wage the davis bacon language that we do if there was another side agreement that was uh within the law a legal side agreement that we could pursue with the developer uh that's something that we could also enter into a side agreement on depending upon what it was thank you yeah. thank you council member spitzley uh following that is council member dunbar anyone else with questions yeah, uh, council member dunbar this is just a quick question on the tenancy there how much turnover do you have, and is most of it carried over over the years? Because I've, the people I've talked with have lived there for many, many years. So is that what you're seeing, or do you have a certain have percentage sure of turnover each year that might be re well, changing the makeup of it more yeah, from senior to um, the families? Yeah. So the residents that have aged in place tend to stay, so we do have some turnover annually okay. uh, on those units as well. But uh, we have you know, roughly 30 to 40% uh, annual turnover that's mostly comprised of our market rate units. Okay. So we see most of it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you for being here this evening. Um, I th we will be back at committee. When's the next committee of DMP? Next week? We'll, we'll be in touch with scheduling. Wednesday. Yeah, next Wednesday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Mr. Clerk. Okay. Our next presentation is the Porter Senior Apartments. Good evening. Good evening. If you could please introduce yourselves for the council and then uh, the floor is yours and the clicker works uh, for you just like the rest of the folks. So just clicker. press it, press it when they're ready to advance your slide. Perfect. Thank you so much. My name is Felipe Serpa. I'm uh, here on behalf of uh, Redwood Housing. Thank you so much. Sorry to interrupt. If we're, we are having trouble up here with the sound projects in the audience. So if you could pull the mic closer to your face, please. That, is this good? That's perfect. Thank perfect. you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, council members, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Felipe Serpa. I'm here on behalf of Redwood Housing, um, and I'm here to discuss uh, a proposal for a 4% pilot um, at the Porter. Um, with me, I have uh, Jill Esses. Uh, she is the regional manager for KMG Prestige, which is uh, the new property management uh, company that we have uh, hired and uh, is currently uh, managing the property. Um, so um, I want to talk uh, briefly about uh, Redwood Housing. Uh, we are new in town. Um, I want to talk about what we plan to do um, with the uh, substantial rehabilitation uh, of a you know critical community asset that uh, has historic significance to the city of Lansing. Um, and I want to talk about uh, the partnership that we're hoping to foster with uh, the city, uh, particularly with the council, uh, in order to you know, benefit our residents and benefit the community uh, at large. Um, so with that, let's uh, dive right in. Ownership overview. Um, Redwood Housing, uh, we are affordable housing developers, of course, um, and we are focused on raising the standard of living uh, for low-income seniors uh, and families. Um, we are dedicated to preserving and meaningfully improving the uh, current stock of affordable housing. And we'll, how, what we do this, how we do this is through the acquisition and the substantial rehabilitation of, of existing properties. Um, so we're all about preservation. Um, we firmly believe, and we, and we see this across the country, that rehabilitations uh, not only improve the living condition of our residents, which is paramount, of course, but it also helps strengthen uh, surrounding communities. Um, and uh, to do so, um, 
to support our mission. Uh, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Support our mission. Um, you know, we assemble teams of passionate advocates uh, in the affordable housing space, with deep, deep knowledge of, of the types of, of properties that we that we steward. Um, we've had great success uh, working alongside governments, nonprofits, um, some of which uh, we'll be happy to put you all in touch with. Um, and uh, to date, uh, we are stewards of uh, roughly uh, greater than uh, 20,000 uh, units uh, across uh, 15 states, uh, and that includes Michigan. Um, next slide. Uh, management overview. So, um, you know, the Porter, um, everybody here is familiar with the Porter, uh, of course. <laughs> um, so one of the things that, uh, you know, we, we really wanted to do was hit the ground running. Um, complete change, change of ownership, change of management. Um, we, we wanted it to be impactful right out of the gate. So what we did was partner with KMG Prestige. That they are local, and they were actually mentioned um, in the Walter French, I believe, uh, that were on one of those slides. But they are local to Michigan. Um, they're uh, headquartered out of Mount Pleasant. They have a 37-year uh, track record of success here in the Midwest. Uh, they currently manage over 25,000 apartments, uh, including six properties here in Lansing that are affordable, uh, as well as market rate community directly across the street. This is new development, the Metro, uh, that's directly across the street from us. Um, but uh, KMG's, uh, you know, bread and butter really, um, and Joe can speak more towards that, is uh, HUD and LIHTC regulated properties, which is what uh, the Porter is. Um, HUD right now, LIHTC here in the near future. Um, one of the things that we're super excited about KMG's involvement is on the uh, service coordinator front. Um, the property currently benefits from a service coordinator grant. We have a service coordinator on site. Um, and KMG, uh, is a leader in this space. They have a dedicated quality assurance uh, arm um, in-house uh, run by a woman named Kelly Green, who I'm very fond of. Um, and what her group does essentially is provide uh, targeted oversight and guidance um, to uh, pr both properties that KMG manages, but as well as a third-party service to uh, other, um, other properties that benefit from a service coordinator grant. Um, every QA provider uh, in the program uh, has a master's degree uh, in uh, service-related fields uh, and have no less than three years' experience uh, participating in a service coordinator uh, program. So um, I will, if you don't mind, I'll get through the presentation. Maybe you can direct some questions to Jill um, on this front. So uh, next slide here. What have we done since we took stewardship of the Porter? Um, you know, in, in the short period that, that, we've, uh, that we've been stewards of, of the Porter uh, since May 2021, uh, with KMG's leadership, uh, we've been able to implement um, a, a good amount, a great amount, I would say, of uh, corrective measures to was was a frankly poorly managed property. Um, we obviously conducted 100% unit inspection uh, and corrected health and safety deficiencies as we saw them. We hired a new pest control uh, company, um, who uh, is a is a partner of KMG's across the state. Uh, and uh, we've uh, contractually, uh, we've entered uh, into a contract that uh, is robust and uh, is frankly required to abate what has been a long, long standing issue uh, at, at the Porter. Um, we've obviously implemented daily interior and exterior cleanings. Um, we repaired the entry system, um, which was uh, obviously a security concern. Uh, we've purchased new laundry equipment. Um, and we're in the process of expanding the services available to um, to our residents through the service coordinator program. Um, as as a, a part of that, as well as communication, um, I've personally taken part in two uh, resident-wide meetings um, where I introduced myself as ownership, introduced KMG. Uh, I believe Jill's boss was there, uh, David Sewell, who is uh, vice president. Um, and we really uh, took the time to, you know, engage with tenants, explain to them what our mission was, explain to them what uh, the, the, the following uh, months are gonna entail and what the reno proposed renovation is going to uh, entail. Um, you know, and obviously going forward, this is something we're gonna continue. KMG uh, continues to have regular and open dialogue with all our residents, um, and we're ensuring that their needs are met. Um, so, you know, we're very happy with KMG. We, as a matter of fact, we're partnering with them um, all across the country, across the Midwest, um, and they're, they're a fantastic property manager that we're very excited about. Uh, Joe can talk a little bit about um, the service coordinator piece and what we're going to be doing there in the near future. 
So let's talk a little bit about the property itself. Um, this obviously is a building that everybody is uh, well acquainted with, as we know. Uh, the portal was originally built in 1918, uh, located within the uh, Lansing Downtown Historic District. Um, as a matter of fact, we will be implementing uh, using rather uh, historical tax credit equity as well as uh, low-income ho housing tax credit equity. Um, and you know, prior to uh, being a senior affordable housing, uh, the Porter uh, uh, operated as a uh, hotel and market rate apartments. Um, you know, while rich in history, the Porter uh, has unfortunately been neglected and is in need of extensive, extensive repairs, um, which we will talk about. Uh, our proposed renovation is comprehensive. Uh, it's a historically driven renovation. Uh, it will feature both interior and exterior uh, upgrades. It will feature community space upgrades, and of course, uh, the apartments themselves will, will receive upgrades, and it will receive um, new mechanical uh, and HVAC equipment, which we'll get into as well. Um, one of the things that we're really proud of is, is the overwhelming support that we receive from our residents. Um, as a matter of fact, I have here a letter of support uh, signed by an overwhelming majority of our residents, um, which um, I can submit for the record should that be uh, required. Um, but uh, residents are excited. Uh, that's the bottom line. I think that uh, they've endured a lot over the past decade, I suppose, or even longer perhaps. Um, and I think they're really seeing a change. Um, Joe will definitely speak more towards that. Um, so, uh, why a 4% pilot? Um, the incremental investment that we can make uh, is really going to be made possible uh, with the support of the City Council. That's what we talk about partnerships with, with, uh, with municipalities. Um, a 4% pilot uh, is going to afford a fantastic renovation, which I'll get into here in a minute. Um, so, um, let's move towards that with our renovation over. So like I mentioned, this is a comprehensive historic restoration slash renovation. Um, it is going to create um, high, high quality affordable housing that's, uh, that frankly has been uh, neglected for some time. Um, we're going to have a historically compatible envelope restoration. This includes facade repairs, so will include a new roof. Most importantly, I believe, uh, is the elimination of what is an antiquated and frankly failing municipal steam heating system. Um, we are going to be introducing new central heating and cooling, um, which we're very excited about, and I know that the residents are, are as well. And uh, we'll also have uh, further MEP upgrades, mechanical, electrical, plumbing upgrades, full elevator modernization, um, complete kitchen, bathroom uh, upgrades in the units, um, modernization of the community amenities, uh, and upgrades to all common areas. Again, I'll get into the particulars here in a minute. And then importantly as well, accessibility and life safety upgrades. Um, we're gonna expect a reduction in the energy consumption and uh, the carbon output of the property given our move off of the municipal steam system, um, which we're excited about as well. And uh, one of the things that I do wanna emphasize here on, on the re rehabilitation itself is, is the uh, expected uh, impact on the local labor force. Um, so um, we have uh, a handful of commitments here that, we're, that we'll be making uh, through Mishto or otherwise, um, and in, in obviously in partnership with Paragon Construction Company, which is a general contractor on this project. Um, we will be uh, providing local labor, uh, competitive wages, benefits, and 401k plans, to name a few uh, items in, on the world of benefits. Um, we estimate at this juncture to be using about 80% uh, of the full labor force will be local. Um, in speaking with our general contractor, uh, the subcontractors that have been engaged uh, will be paying competitive wages, like I mentioned. Um, I think it was mentioned previously that uh, this is an extremely competitive construction market um, uh, today, um, uh, nationally, really. Um, and, you know, this is obviously a matter of principle um, as well. Um, we are estimating between 25 and $45 an hour for the, uh, the workers on site. Um, and obviously this is dependent on the trade and on the tenure. And I think uh, it's important to compare this to what was mentioned before, um, Davis Bacon, for example. Um, I pulled this, some stats off of um, SAMS.gov, which is the a federal repository for this type of information. Um, for Ingham County in 2021, um, what I found was uh, anywhere between $13 an hour to $48 an hour on the low end being uh, 
a truck driver, for example, on the high end being a certified electrician. So we, we really feel like the commitment that we're making um, is right there with uh, you know, where the labor market is and um, where um, competitive wages need to be. Uh, additionally, um, through MISDA, we will be uh, entering into an equal employment opportunity plan. Um, this essentially uh, outlines our, our commitment to hiring uh, from minority uh, approved sublists that are provided by uh, MISDA as well as the Michigan Supplier Development Council. So not only subcontractors, but suppliers of materials as well. And then um, additionally to that, we are committing to uh, a Section 3 uh, renovation. So Section 3 is a race and gender neutral regulation, but it does, um, it does work towards the hiring of, uh, of low-income individuals. So we're committing uh, at least 10% of the dollar value of the prime contract to be awarded to qualified subs um, who will employ low-income individuals. Um, let me move to my next slide. So, some particulars and uh, details here. So what we have here is a general architectural floor plan. Um, this is uh, the ground floor, uh, and this is just an architecture page. But um, what, I, what I wanted to do was kind of you know, hit, some, um, uh, hit some specifics. Um, so we will be uh, doing new paint, new flooring, accessibility uh, compliance upgrades. Uh, for example, in the laundry room, uh, we need to adjust the height of a countertop, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but it is if you're in a wheelchair. Um, like I mentioned, all new appliances, LED, high efficiency lighting, new ceiling fans, switches, outlets, new ceiling tiles, um, and this goes for the hallways as well, of course. Um, new exit signs, new switches and outlets, uh, a new drinking fountain, drywall repairs, new fire extinguishers. And then what I'm most excited about, and uh, I'm not an engineer, <laughs> but, uh, but this kind of it really, really um, piques my interest, uh, the mechanical equipment. So what we're looking at here is uh, um, a mechanical drawing of the um, new hydronic piping that's, gonna, that's going to uh, power the hybrid pump system that will introduce cooling to the building for the first time, and uh, at least central cooling, um, and, uh, and keep the heating as well. So um, the steam system. Um, steam system has been causing issues across the board as far as we understand it. It's an antiquated system that is uh, on the verge of failure. Every time they switch over to heat, there's, it just pops and there's leaks all over the place. It's also um, a great point of entry for rodents, I've been told. Um, so we're very excited about being able to uh, essentially abandon the system in place by cutting and capping um, and moving to a central uh, hybrid heat pump system. Um, I, th I think it's really important to uh, highlight a couple of things on this front, which um, I can also get into in more detail, but the building is currently does not have central cooling. At this juncture, if you're a tenant in the building and you want air conditioning in your unit, you have a, a, a window unit. Um, and the electricity that uh, that window unit draws is the uh, only utility that you, uh, as a tenant, are uh, charged with paying. This will remain the case. Um, this will remain the case. Tenants will, remain, will only have the electrical bills to pay directly. Um, and it, uh, our engineers have uh, done some back of the envelope analysis that basically states that the apples to apples comparison between the proposed system and the window units, the electrical draw is, if not the same, a little bit less with the central cooling that we're gonna be introducing. And again, it's an on-demand system. So if uh, you'd like to save a couple shekels and, and not turn on cooling at all times of the day, you'll rem that will remain an option. Um, so let's move to the next slide. Um, this is a, 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 a roof plan, um, again, highlighting some of the mechanical equipment. Um, we'll have a new uh, dry fluid cooler on the roof, low profile, uh, replaces the existing cooling tower. It's extremely efficient, um, requires less maintenance, uh, and then uh, it also mitigates the possibility of contaminants. Uh, your traditional cooling tower has an open water source, so um, this is a great mitigant to potential risk there. Um, and we'll move on to the next slide. The other thing I want to talk about and uh, not to lose sight of is um, the current uh, site plan. Um, 
this is not only going to be a, a renovation of the building itself, but it's also going to include work on the site, um, primarily on, in the parking lot. I believe there's about 54 spaces, if my memory corrects me. Uh, excuse me, if my memory is correct. We will be um, restriping, sealing, uh, and replacing signage. We will be introducing landscape improvements, tree trimming, and such. Uh, there will be accessibility path of travel improvements. We're actually going to redo the ramp that the previous owners uh, put into place, which apparently is not compliant, which is not um, accessibility accessible. Uh, it's not ADA compliant, so that's a piece of work that we're going to have to do as well. Um, we'll repair concrete trip hazards. Um, we will install solar parking light poles, uh, which again is, goes towards the uh, you know efficiency uh, piece of the equation here. And um, we will also be replacing the backup generator that's on site. And now a beautiful rendering. So um, I, I think that this is, I, I really get a kick of, of uh, the architect piece, the architecture piece is, is something that really, really uh, piques my interest. Um, I think that this is a beautiful building that represents um, fantastic architecture. And I'm very thrilled to um, be able to be part of a project that's gonna really um, restore the historic nature of this, of this building in downtown Lansing. It will include masonry restorations, tuck pointing, um, patching of damaged areas, the cleaning um, and the restoration of the beautiful limestone. We're gonna be replacing some uh, missing pieces of the metal cornice uh, at the top of the building. Um, which is uh, rusting and, and, and disrepair. And then obviously low pressure washing the exterior, resealing all of those windows, cleaning all the windows, uh, and obviously painting um, metal railings and light poles. So now to the numbers. Why a 4% pilot? That was something that was brought up during the planning uh, development and planning uh, subcommittee. We've done, we've done extensive analysis on what is feasible and what is not feasible. Um, and you have some numbers here in front of you that I'll touch on at a high level and then I'll get a little bit into why these numbers uh, shake out the way that they do. With your support, with the city council's support, uh, Redwood and our affiliates are committed to investing north of $70,000 per unit into this critical, critical community asset. Um, this translates to roughly $7 million of hard costs, meaning direct construction costs. Um, and if we were to pursue a 10% pilot, which is uh, pro forma, um, our analysis indicates that we would be able to do a, a fraction of that, roughly $25,000 per door, um, $2 million and a half dollars uh, in hard costs. What that really translates to is almost a, th a 3x amount increase in investment that we're putting directly back into this com uh, critical community asset. Um, almost two times the amount of, of uh, dollars in the units themselves where the residents will obviously get the most um, use in their homes. Um, without the 4% pilot, we're, we'll be basically in, uh, entering into a, a, repair, uh, a, a repair program. HVAC repairs, um, we would have to, we'll be forced to maintain the steam system and continue to uh, repair the system. There wouldn't really be a historically significant restoration um, uh, and it would really just become upgrades um, on just a, a roof replacement. So, so wh why is this the case? Um, I think that's a valid and great question that was asked uh, previously um, at the Development and Planning Committee. The, uh, it, everything here is kind of like a, cir a circular loop. Um, uh, like like uh, was uh, alluded to previously, the debt service coverage is uh, a key a metric to um, that uh, dictates the amount of dollars uh, by way of construction loans that uh, are eligible for these projects. The costs associated with not, the operating costs associated with not pursuing this full rehabilitation um, will basically end up costing us more in insurance, obviously more in repair and maintenance. We would, have, we would remain high on the utilities front. Um, one of the things that I didn't mention but that I should hear the overall uh, utility costs that are going to be, uh, the utility savings uh, come out to roughly 47000 a year. That's our, our uh, back of the envelope numbers when it comes to getting off of the municipal steam. Um, and it's important to note that the pilot is based on um, sheltered rents net of utilities. 
Um, obviously, the reserves uh, go up, and then obviously our tax line item, uh, line item goes up. Um, what that essentially does is uh, lowers the amount of dollars that we can invest directly into into the re rehabilitation. The 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 um, the development itself is is contingent on the participation of not only the city of Lansing, of course, but also the federal government. This is a Section 8 property. Um, all 98 senior uh, apartments are covered uh, by the HAP contract. And the rehab that we're undertaking um, will go in under a what's called a markup to market. Um, essentially, we tell HUD we're going to perform this fantastic renovation, and HUD increases the subsidy. The, the discussion about the increase in rent um, in the, with the previous presenter uh, applies here. There will be an increase in subsidy, which allows for, obviously, higher net income. But there will not be an increase in the amount of dollars out of pocket that our residents will incur. Um, without the rehab, without the comprehensive rehab, we will not get the markup to market from HUD. This is all interconnected. It's federal level with HUD, it's state level with MISHTA through the uh, issuance of bonds and credits, and obviously it's local with the, with the support of, of uh, Lansing. So this is all uh, really working together. Um, the other thing I really wanted to point out here is that um, with this markup to market, there will uh, still be an increase in the tax base that currently goes in to the city's coffers uh, currently. Um, we project a $51,000 a year average across 15 years uh, by way of, of tax uh, revenue to the city, which represents uh, two times what uh, the current uh, tax bill is for the pilot that's in place. Um, roughly $25,000 uh, were paid um, for the summer of 2021. Um, and across the 15 years, this translates to roughly $770,000 of, of tax revenue to the city of Lansing. I'm sure I'll get a lot of questions on that. I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here and to discuss this. So um, we will move on to the next slide. We talked a little bit about this uh, previously, but um, what you see here on this slide is um, the overwhelming tenant support um, that we've garnered, um, frankly, uh, due to um, the, the really the, the, change, the change of attitude and the change of, of pace that KMG has brought to the table. Um, and um, you know the the uh, the comprehensive rehabilitation that everybody's uh, is looking forward to. We have um, overwhelming support from uh, our tenant base um, by way of signing um, this uh, letter to you all. Um, and tenants are obviously seeing improvements already. We 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 really we really feel strongly about that. Um, the pest control issue uh, comes is, is comes to mind, obviously. But I think um, management is really the the first line of. Uh, I won't call it the first line of defense, but it's it, it, a good management team is 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 first in line to uh, address tenant uh, concerns, and we're very proud to be partnered with KMG. Um, so, um, I, I will talk a little bit about why we feel that a comprehensive rehab not only benefits the residents, well, uh, of course, but also the wider community. So, I have uh, some stats here, and I'd be happy to provide you with uh, with the source material. Um, one, uh, properties uh, with dedicated resident service programs like the, uh, like the Porter are associated with a 50% lower uh, rate of police and emergency and non-emergency calls. Um, and I'd just, uh, just like to mention and uh, give my condolences to Council Member Wood, um, who uh, was mentioned, uh, I believe it was an FU, Rick was mentioned to be an EMS. Um, supportive housing is also correlated with an 18% reduction in emergency room visits. Um, municipalities uh, benefit from the redevelopment of affordable housing uh, as the activity leads to uh, further community investment uh, and appreciating values. Um, and cities and states also benefit financially uh, from uh, employment and construction uh, activities, which we, uh, we discussed earlier. Um, so it, just to, to you know, emphasize, the Porter is now offering enhanced resident services, will continue to. Uh, and then with your support, with the city council support, uh, by way of 4% pilot, um, the comprehensive renovation that we're so happy uh, and proud to be undertaking will provide lasting dividends, not only for the project residents, but for the city of Lansing uh, as a whole. Um, 
I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we're really good at this. Um, this, is, this is really our bread and butter, uh, historic renovations. So I wanted to briefly talk about a case study um, in, in, in Washington State in Tacoma, uh, the Winthrop. Um, this, this is a really analogous project uh, to the Porter. It was built in 1925 um, as a luxury hotel. And uh, it was converted to affordable housing circa 1972. Uh, Roughly double the size, um, 200 families call it home, Seven, 175 of those families are supported by Section 8 uh, assistance. Um, and since its conversion to affordable housing, uh, the project has been starved of capital investment and frankly was on the verge of failure before uh, Redwood stepped in, which again is analogous to the Porter. Um, there was an ex extensive renovation uh, and development plan uh, to preserve and revitalize the property. Uh, much to the disappointment of developers uh, who were circling it, uh, trying to convert it to market rate uh, housing. It's, it's a beautiful building in, in a really cool part of, of Washington State, uh, adjacent to Seattle. Um, the exhausted rehab, exhaustive rehab, excuse me, included a renovation budget of more than $150,000 per unit, and uh, it resulted in the preservation of yet another critical community asset. Uh, and, and it was analogous in the sense of, of what, was, uh, what was in need uh, of replacing. Um, envelope, roofs, windows, elevators, plumbing systems, the mechanical systems. It also had a, uh, a seismic uh, retrofit that was required, um, as well as the upgrading and the modernization of the common areas uh, and the apartments. So uh, it, it's something that we're really proud of and um, something that we, we frankly do and we're, we're very excited to be able to bring that sort of expertise to the city of Lansing. Um, we'd be more than happy to put you all in front with uh, the city of Tacoma, uh, the executive uh, director of the uh, Tacoma Housing Authority, and or anybody else that uh, you'd like to speak to about us, obviously. Um, and lastly, um, we're just going to flip through this quickly because um, I've been rambling for a while here and I'd love to answer some questions. Um, what, do, what do we do here? Um, again, analogous to the Porter, um, an extensive mechanical system upgrades, um, as you see by the before and after pictures here. Um, that's a similar historic details um, that uh, as the porter, uh, there was a, a building envelope had been significantly compromised. Uh, certain areas of the project uh, had been condemned, in fact, uh, prior to the comprehensive renovation that we undertook. Um, and you see here, the facade and the windows throughout the project were essentially um, beyond their useful lives, uh, and it was causing water infiltration into the building. Um, we installed energy efficient and uh, historically compatible windows in this uh, case. Here's a uh, before and after of, of, the, uh, of the entrance. Um, new roof in the same way that we will be uh, doing at the Porter. Uh, some more uh, historical details. Uh, some of the railing there was in really poor condition and structurally unsafe. We obviously addressed that. And then here's uh, some shots of the interior. Um, here's the interior hallway, and you can see the specifications that we choose um, are market rate adjacent. You know, w one of the things that I love to say is that our, our rehabs are places that, that um, you know, I would myself be proud to, to live in, um, and I mean that's really laundry equipment, again, analogous to the Porter, and uh, here's a before and after shot of uh, one of the units itself. And then last but not least, um, the constant leaks from the plumbing, which again is analogous to the steam system here, was really causing damage to the common areas. Um, so we included a, a historically significant um, rehab of the uh, crystal ballroom um, with historical relics, um, and this uh, currently serves as a, a cur serves the Barta community. So I think that's fantastic. And uh, with that, I would um, be happy to entertain questions, um, both myself and, and Jill here. Thank you very much uh, for a very thorough presentation. Um, I, do know, I do have a few folks that have identified that they have questions already. Councilmember Spitzley, you're up first, followed by Councilmember Wood. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so you guys still, you have a current pilot right now. Is that correct? That is correct. And how much is that? It is also a 4% pilot. And how much time left do you have on that? I believe it runs through 22. Till 2022, is that correct. what you said? Yes, okay. uh, I can get you the exact details on that, but I, that's yeah. my recollection, yes. Okay. How long have you owned the property? We purchased the property uh, in May of this year. Okay. Um, are you still requiring your tenants to pay for window air conditioning units? Are we still requiring to pay our tenants for... Uh, no, no, no. Are you still requiring tenants 
to pay for air conditioning units. The physical units themselves yes, for them to buy that them? that is correct. Is that, I'm not sure, but a joke and answer. Uh, it's, as of this point, uh, residents have their own air conditioning units. N um, nobody has come to us and asked us to buy one for them. Um, as we came into the hot heat of the summer, residents came down and requested us to install their air conditioning units they already had. So that were in their like closet. So there are there are tenants right now that do not have air conditioning in their units. I believe so. Okay. Um, my final question is: What investments have you put have you made to the property since you owned it? Oh, absolutely. We talked a little bit about this, and Joe can can elaborate. Um, number one, um, we implemented a robust and far beyond what was being done. Uh, by way of, of uh, pest control mitigation. So um, that, I believe, is twice a week now. Um, I believe our bed bug uh, plan before we only included the actual units that were reporting bed bugs. Now we're actually addressing uh, the adjacent units uh, on both sides of, of, that, of those apartments. Um, we, uh, we replaced the laundry equipment. Mm -hmm. um, we fixed the entry system, that which had been in disrepair for quite some time, we were told. Um, and what else? We, I mean, we've done a, what else have we done? Anything else you would point um, to? We, we have uh, fixed the hot water heater. Uh, uh, the hot water heater was in disrepair, and that is now fixed where the residents have hot water on a regular basis. Um, I think that's, that's, a, yeah. that's a good list there. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you very much. Council Member Wood. Uh, thank you, President Spadafore. Um, First of all, the, the fact that you purchased this in May, I would assume, and maybe I'm wrong with this, that your whole intent was to come before this council with a pilot from the very purchase. Is, is that correct? Sure. It's, it's an interesting story. Um, the previous pilot, the physical documentation was not presented to us by the previous owner. Um, and uh, in speaking, uh, with, um, with the city, it appears that there isn't physical record of the pilot, but obviously it's been Im implemented and the pilot has been in place as, as you know, pro forma. Um, so that was kind of first, the first thing we had to figure out. What, what, what pilot is in place? What's being paid by way of taxes? What's the extent of the, of the current pilot? Um, and, in, and what do we need to do to keep the 4% pilot uh, throughout the, the, our, our stewardship? I don't think you answered my question. Sure. The, the, the question was, was your intent to come for a pilot? You would have needed the money to make the repairs sure. and the things that have yes. to be done. Yes, to answer so your question, that's, that's right. That yes. was your intent correct. to begin with. Correct, correct, correct. Okay. Having said that, I, you know, when I look through this, first of all, I want to tell you that I'm not surprised that you had overwhelming tenant support um, sure. Not because of you. Given the circumstances. <laughs> that I just want to make clear. It's not because of you. <coughs> of it's course. It's the fact that they have wanted repairs made on that place forever and the fact that there have been numerous people that have made uh, promises for them and so they're looking, grabbing at any straw at this point. Sure. Um, when I look at some of the comments that you made in here about things that you had done you talked about um, the, the entry, you talked about um, hiring um, for bed bug control and, and things like that. But then you made a statement that the ramp did not meet code and that there were trip hazards. Sure. So those are violations right there that you haven't taken care of. Why? We are going to address them throughout the comprehensive renovation. But to, uh, to your point, um, should we uh, be required to do other things? I'm sure, I'm sure that's something we can look at. My, my point is, is that you have unsafe conditions for seniors in that building right now. And I'm not sure why you're not taking care of it, other than the fact that you're waiting for council to give you a pilot of 4%, which will go in in October, which by the time the the building, it, you go through your contracting and everything else, 
wouldn't be until spring or summer of next year. And these clients, these uh, residents, are continuously dealing with unsafe conditions. That's a fair point, Council Member. I will take it into consideration. Thank you. When you talk about um, bed bugs, I know one of the previous um, owners and their management that if you had uh, reoccurring bed bugs, the uh, tenants were charged for uh, the pest control. Do you charge the tenants for additional if they have to come back in? Um, because we're HUD, HUD limits us from charging the residents unless we can prove without a doubt that they have created the problem. It's very hard to do that. At this, we are, we're not charging residents. We're actually, um, uh, we're helping them with getting their laundry done. If they can't afford to do their laundry, we're giving them laundry tokens so that they can wash their clothes while the treatment is happening. Uh, we are helping them out um, in many ways of trying to get them services to help with the prep, because a lot of our residents are unable to prep. So no, we're not charging them uh, because this is a, a, a building-wide issue. We couldn't go through there and pinpoint any one person to say that it was their fault. So no, they're not being charged. The new laundry equipment, what is the charge for doing laundry? Sure. Um, it, it is a dollar to wash and a dollar to dry, currently. Okay. And, and, we're, and we're talking about low-income people. At um, laundry mats, it, it's upwards of 250 to wash and 250 to dry because I go to the laundry mat. Okay. Um, you indicate on here that the average is going to be seventy thousand dollars per unit. Does that seventy thousand dollars round in the um, replacement? of the furnace and that is considered a breakdown per unit. That, yeah, that, that includes comprehensive oh, okay. renovation, yes. Okay, so I, I'm happy what, to provide, would uh, physical, what would be the physical amount of improvements that would be for each unit? Not so, counting the, the sure. um, electrical, the, the plumbing, the, you know, any of those, the heating. Just, just for clarification, you want the breakdown of how many dollars per unit will go directly into the apartments themselves? Correct. Great. I, I don't have that with me right now, but I'm more than happy to provide that um, to, to the subcommittee and have that prepared for you guys. Okay. I'd like to know what that is. Absolutely. Um, will you have Wi-Fi in the building? Yes. Per unit or in a common area? Uh, we typically do uh, common areas, but also uh, install um, adapters in, in the hallways, which will reach into the, the apartments themselves, yes. All right. Thank you. All right, that's it for my questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you but, very much. Thank you. Uh, Vice President Hussein, followed by Councilmember Dunbar. Sure, just a, a couple of housekeeping questions first. Um, are, are the elevators in the building now all operable? I'm, I'm sorry. Are all elevators in the building now operable? Operating. Yes. So I know that we have a, a resident elevator and then there's a service elevator. I can't speak to their operability, but I believe they are, yes. Mm -hmm. They are. Yes, yes. Okay, what about TCRs, trash chute rooms, and your trash compactor on all floors? Uh, we do, we have, uh, we, they, we don't have a trash, we do have a trash compactor, but um, we have um, a single, I, I'll, t I'll let the yeah. uh, property manager talk about this. Yeah. We do have, there are trash rooms, uh, the trash compact, compactor, my understanding is uh, the last management company quit using that because the chute had gotten plugged. So we need to get that unplugged. Uh, so those doors are closed, but we do have the, uh, the trash, you know, we make sure trash gets out. I'm sorry, I missed that. So I'm disabled, I'm up on the fourth floor, I need my trash disposed of. How do I do it now? Well, they can call us and we'll come and get it. And okay. we've told several senior citizens and um, disabled residents that if they need help with their trash, we, they'll give us a call. I visited the property several, mm -hmm. several months ago and I was mm -hmm. appalled by the conditions, candidly. Um, and it was, you know, yes. it was apparent that the owner and the management company 
you know, there was a dereliction of duty, period. Um, and one of the things that I um, discussed with them at that time was the plugging of that, that chute. I cannot believe that it's still plugged. And I cannot believe and, that's still an issue. And, that, and that uh, we have me. had so much on our plate I, as I we've been in that. there. But, um, but with all due respect, with yeah, all due respect, yeah, we, are, well, hold on. with all due respect, you all, you all took ownership of this building. You decided to allow yourself to be inserted as a management company. So I don't care what's on your plate. Because you can't imagine, as we talk to the residents there, what's on their plate. Okay, sure. It's not a good situation, so I, I don't care. Um, that's with, duly noted. Thank you. With regard to the, um, to the bed bugs, I would highly encourage not just the adjacent units, but the above and below units. Sure. Well. That is and best That practice. might be and taking we place. We are inspecting all of them. On a, okay. on a, they, they do come twice a week. Um, they are treating and retreating and reinspecting to continue to make sure that those that don't have it still do not. Okay. Those that they've eradicated or still do not have it, they're, they're reinspecting on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay, so, so when you took ownership and you inserted KMG, did KMG keep on any of the employees that were on site, any of the on site employees? I don't believe so. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but I so believe it's entirely, it's new, entirely new staff, yes. Okay. Um, I have a quick question for law. In terms of the state statute that allows for uh, the service fee in charge of, or I'm sorry, in lieu of um, taxes, property taxes, what, what are the thresholds there? What are the limits? How, how, in terms of duration, in terms of percentage, can they, can they only go up to 40 years? Can they go up to 50? Can they go below 4%? How does it, what are the limitations there? Generally, uh, you can request from the municipality consideration to any kind of a pilot below, uh, or 9% and lower. 10%. But to what? I know what 10% is by right. I, are they able to say 1%, 2%, or is 4% the bottom? I think that's floor, correct? Uh, I haven't seen anything lower than a 4%. I'm not aware of any restriction from some, for somebody to ask for something lower than a 4%. If you, okay, if you could look into that, I appreciate sure. it. Sure. Same, same with the duration. Council member, your microphone. Oh, okay. So I, I think you can do uh, okay. one lower than 4%. Yeah. So. But we can provide that with certainty. I'd appreciate that, but yeah, thank you. Um, what, what about, so, and I understand that we don't know how much you're, you're looking to um, actually invest uh, within the actual unit, sure. um, but at a 4%, 40 years, um, and, and when you look at the number that you, you guys are quoting here, um, I'm assuming it would be substantial. What is, how does that affect, because we're talking about uh, seniors, we're talking about people that have mobility issues, sure. how does that affect certainty in terms of housing, transiency, is there a plan to move them from unit to unit as you get into units and, and Absolutely. fix you keep That's them a fantastic certain question. Yeah, what's, Thank you. what's the plan? Um, I think, I think the, the, really the crux of, of your question is how we're gonna implement this Absolutely. renovation. Right. Um, so, uh, and we do this across the country, we engage with a third party relocation specialist, in this case, uh, Housing mm -hmm. Opportunities Unlimited. Um, and what we do is a phased relocation and phased re rehabilitation, where uh, in this instance, uh, given the nature of the rehab, we're gonna be doing it by stacks where we provide support, we provide offsite housing, we provide moving expense costs, we provide everything under the sun so that the resident themselves has no burden on uh, other than having to physically move um, to a, uh, another apartment uh, for a short duration. Uh, and then we move them right back as soon as their apartment is, is finished. Um, that's something that we're uh, currently anticipating to take, if my memory serves me, between three and four weeks. Um, for the for the for the rehab to occur, and that primarily has to do with the installation of, of the new mechanical systems for the central air. Okay, I appreciate that. Last thing for me, um, a lot of my questions were answered in DMP. Um, who you you referenced a general contractor you're working with? Who is that? It's a group called uh, Paragon Construction Company. Where are they from? Uh, they are from, I believe. Uh, I know they're from New Mexico. New Mexico. Correct. It's important to, to note that the um, general contractor will hire the subcontractor base, which, like I mentioned, um, is roughly 80% local. And, uh, and just for the record, this is just an anecdote. The proprietor uh, is from Michigan, but I know that. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Council Member Dunbar?
Thank you. Um, there was a question earlier about how much was going to be invested per unit if um, you received the 4% renovation. I'm, you said you didn't have that, but I'm looking at the um, hard cost scope of work. Oh, sure. And in the unit section. Oh, we have it right there. You're correct. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I'm, so I'm just super I'm just absent minded. I apologize. Wondering it's if right that's, there. we're all Good. accurate with that. It is yeah. right there, and I do apologize. I had the answer in front of me. Okay, that's all right. I just, yeah. So we're looking at new appliances, doors and hardware, ceiling fan, unit signage, wireless emergency call system, countertops, tub surrounds, low floor toilets, blinds and shades, LVP flooring, paint, accessibility upgrades, excuse me, repair cabinets, drywall, switch plates, outlets, smoke detectors, plumbing fixtures, exhaust fans and lighting, and that looks like the two combined together yes, uh, yeah, look like right 22000 That's right. roughly $22,000 worth of improvements per unit. Thank you so much for pointing that out. That's okay. fantastic. We had the answer sure. right in front of us. I apologize for that. Anyone else? Very good. Uh, first, I have one real quick question. Please clarify. You bought in May of 2021? Correct. Oh, so three months ago. Correct. Okay. I just want to clarify if it was three months or 15. Thank you. Uh, I also want to thank you for recognizing the mismanagement, the neglect, and the terrible circumstances under which many of those residents lived for far too long. And sure. I can tell, I mean, this is an exciting project. It, what, what's, been, what's on paper looks very exciting. I can tell in your voices the enthusiasm for the project, and I do look forward to hearing what our DMP committee comes up with after the next hearing. So thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for answering our questions. Please have a good night. Thank you so much. We're uh, very happy to be here and uh, look forward to it. Thank you so much. I suggest cleaning the garbage chute before you come back. Till absolutely, the absolutely. Just, <laughs> garbage chute. We're making notes. Garbage chute is number one on the list here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Okay, we are to um, comments by council members and the city clerk. We are to community event announcements. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I didn't ask. I just looked around. Go ahead, council member. <laughs> I just want to point out that clock is wrong. So everyone just be okay. It's, it's not 1030. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. President. Of course. So I wanted to um, make announcement for a couple of events that are happening this, this week. And then I'll, then I'll wait for the mayor to make his announcements and I'll come behind him and remind him of <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Um, this Saturday, August 28th, um, Laugh is Life. It's the comedy show in honor of Marcus, the comedian. Um, it's going to be at Sexton High School Auditorium, 102 McPherson Avenue at 6 p.m. Um, Miranda Burton Hinton is the mother of Marcus, and he was um, murdered last year. Um, she has decided and has um, put together a foundation. Um, and all the proceeds from this uh, comedy show will go to Marcus the Comedian's Foundation. Um, tickets are $25, um, and if you're interested in donating or purchasing a ticket, um, please email um, at MirandaBurtonHinton at gmail.com or look on Facebook at Comedian P. Bates Comedy. Um, so it's a um, great event for a good cause. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is the Women's Center of Greater Lansing has their open house on Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. at 710 East Michigan Avenue, another great organization um, in the city of Lansing. Um, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Suits in the City has their September networking event. If you haven't been to one of those events, you are missing out. Um, September 1st at 6 p.m at the Urban Beat. Thank you. Councilmember Dunbar. Thank you. Um, we all got an email today um, from Dick Pefley at the Board of Water and Light, which I um, want to get out because of the timely manner of this. So because of the pandemic, we didn't have utility shutoffs for a very long time. And um, the collection process is going to um, it actually began already on um, August 9th, and that means the first shutoffs for non-payment would be on September 7th. It's gonna be phased because they obviously can't address all of this at one time, but 
the idea that they are going to be um, considering shutoffs again has put people into a panic mode um, for those who don't have the funds to uh, cover what has been abated uh, basically for the last 24 months or so. So anticipating that there will be problems for folks, um, BWL is teaming up with community partners, a lot of different agencies, and they are going to hold um, basically pandemic financial assistance uh, meetings to help folks figure out what to do about their utility bills. And the first one is going to be Tuesday, August 31st from 4 to 7 at Geyer Community Center. And the second one is Wednesday, September 1st, 4 to 7 at the Alfreda Schmidt Center. Um, so anybody who is worried that now post-pandemic, since the, you know, the utility assistance is gone and the abatements for shutoffs is gone, for folks who need help to um, continue or start paying their bills, please go to either one of these events. Again, Tuesday, August 31st, 4 to 7 at Geyer. Wednesday, September 1st, 4 to 7 at Alfreda Schmidt. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Dunbar. Councilmember, uh, Vice President Hussein. Sure, I'll try to be quick. Um, first, I want to thank uh, folks that came out to our constituent contact meeting, I believe it was August 14th. Uh, we did that in the parking lot of uh, 517 Coffee at 6030 South MLK, and it was awesome. Uh, so I want to first thank uh, the owners, obviously, of 517 for allowing us uh, to kind of, in a very unique way, position, position ourselves in the back part of the parking lot. Um, and we had just a, what I thought was a fantastic turnout, a great conversation. Um, we had elected officials, we had candidates for office, uh, we had various uh, representatives from boards and commissions in the area, uh, and most importantly, we had a number of citizens uh, from South Lansing and really beyond. Uh, and we talked a lot about, um, fittingly enough, because we were on the corridor, Talked a lot about um, corridor improvement, uh, specifically South MLK. Uh, and, and we talked about small business support. We talked about um, kind of workforce development, connecting uh, our workforce with, um, with employers, blight elimination uh, and the like. And that conversation was led by Hannah Bryant from the Lansing Economic Area Partnership. So I want to thank her for being on hand as well. Um, we are meeting in September. That will be September 11th, 10 to 12 noon. Uh, and for this uh, iteration of our contact meetings, we're going to actually be at Wing Heaven Sports Haven, uh, which is at 3812 South MLK. If you have not uh, yet been there, um, come on out, at least for the food. They have the best burgers, turkey burgers, fantastic whole wings, uh, great perch, catfish, uh, and the like. So again, that is uh, September 11th, 10 to 12 noon uh, at 3812 South MLK. Um, quick ask of the, the mayor, I did send an email earlier. Um, we are having a lot of problems with the South Lansing uh, expansion in terms of the river trail. Uh, so I did kick a uh, number of pictures over to Brett Kaczynski. That portion of the trail is not being kept up uh, in the same manner as the other, what, what is it, 10 miles uh, of river trail that's not in South Lansing. There's a lot of, a lot of mattresses, uh, baby strollers, shopping carts, um, you name it, it's there. Um, so we certainly need a uh, concerted effort to get out there and clean that up. Um, and then lastly, this is an incredibly busy weekend. I want to shout out uh, a couple, couple uh, classmates of mine from you know, my days at Everett High School, um, Justin Christian and Dave Jones, and then also somebody that I don't know as well, but he's doing great things for the community, Jody Clemens. Um, and they, are, they have actually been for a number of years. Uh, they've been having a charity alumni basketball game, and, and most often it's included Sexton and Everett, alumni of Sexton and Everett. I think Brian Jackson, Councilman Jackson, actually has participated in that event in the past. Um, and it is, it is once again time. This is a charitable effort. Um, all money does go to, uh, as I understand it, uh, local nonprofits and things of that nature. Uh, and it starts on uh, Friday, and there is an alumni tailgate party. Uh, and this is for the Everett versus Sexton game. Uh, tailgate will begin at 3 p.m. inside of Sexton Stadium. The game starts at 5 p.m. Uh, there will be food for sale uh, provided by Southside Smitty's Barbecue. Uh, and there will be section memorabilia uh, also for sale during the tailgate. Uh, and then the basketball game uh, actually takes place the next day, August 28th. It won't conflict with, um, what is it again? Laugh is love? love yeah, yeah um, because it is at 2 p.m. So doors will open at 1 p.m. Uh, this is at the Don Johnson Fieldhouse uh, on Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, let's see, entry is $5. There are um, opportunities for pre-sale tickets. Uh, and if you are interested and you want to get your tickets in advance, please call Justin Christian 
at 517-775-7975. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, Mr. Clerk. Okay, we are to comment, or I'm sorry, we are to community event announcements. If anyone in the audience has a community event, we'll give you one minute to tell us the details. They're from four to seven, and we'll actually be allowing people to apply for services right there. So we will have Capital Area Housing Partnerships there with Advent House and Holy Cross Ministries, and they'll be able to actually start the application process right there for rental, mortgage, or utility assistance. We'll also have the food bank there. They'll be able to sign up for SNAP. And BWL will be there. We'll have customer service reps there to start flexible payment, pay, payment plans with people, help them sign up for the new customer portal, and just get their bill over to the other uh, people so that they can start holds and things like that for application process. So we'll be doing all of that right on site, and we're really excited about it. And Raleigh's going to talk too, just to reiterate how great the partnership is. Thanks, Brina. I'm just here to reiterate that while the event is being hosted by the Board Water and Light, for folks who are struggling to maintain their rent, internet payments or mortgage payments in Ingham County, we can now say collectively, thanks to the city of Lansing, East Lansing, Ingham County, and Mishta, that there are dollars available to those residents. So again, if you're in Ingham County and you're behind on your utilities, rent, mortgage, or internet payment, you should come to these fairs. If you can't make it to these fairs, to go to our website, go to the city of Lansing's website, and you'll be able to get those applications started. Thanks. Thank you. And seeing no other community event announcements, I will announce speaker registration for public comment on legislative matters. Legislative matters tonight includes the um, scheduled public hearings uh, as well as the items on the consent agenda and resolutions for action. Uh, we'll give you an, one more minute to sign up. That's the blue form in the back. Um, and also, uh, if you are here for the show cause hearing, um, that is the green form in the back. I'll go ahead and call that out if anybody is here for that. Um, um, please sign up in the next minute. That's the green form. So if you're here about 125 East Mount, oh, please uh, go and fill that out as quickly as possible. And with that, we are to the mayor's comments. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Clerk, Mr. President. Um, I wanna congratulate a whole variety of people with many successful events over the last week or two. Um, we had an incredibly successful senior fair. Um, it was awesome. Um, we had some people who took food to go. We had some people who um, enjoyed food there. We had breakfast. We had the meatloaf was incredible. Um, so just like every year, it was great to have it again. Um, but it was just wonderful to see people out. Everybody was wearing masks. Um, they ate. They put their masks back on. We had some folks who were dancing. And it was really nice to, to see that um, happen again. So I was there a good chunk of the day and just had a blast. So thank you to all the seniors and thank you to our park staff who were incredible. Um, we had a very successful art feast in Old Town. We had a very successful arts in the park at Adado. Um, we have a whole variety of events coming up. Um, we, Nancy Malo two or three weeks ago mentioned the East Side Summerfest, which is coming up um, Friday and Saturday, uh, 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. on Friday and 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. on Saturday on Michigan Avenue on the East Side. It's free. Um, and I know our staff worked very hard with Nancy uh, and many of the businesses there to, uh, to get that set up. I know this council, I believe, allocated uh, um, some money last time. Um, so it should be a lot of fun for, um, for those on the east side. Um, our arts grants are now available. We all passed uh, money for arts grants here in Lansing, arts and culture grants, and those are now available. The application deadline is September 14th, and the grant information can be found at lansingarts.org slash program slash grants. That's the, um, the Lansing Arts Council site. So that's good news to, to get some, some art grants out. We've got big dollars and we've got smaller dollars. Um, so I hope all of our artists will apply. Um, we have uh, provided grants for the second round of Lansing Cares Small Business Assistance Program. Uh, it included nine Lansing small businesses. They received a little over $100,000 in forgivable loans. Um, so those dollars are out, and now we are eagerly awaiting the county's Sunrise program, where um, they're giving out something like $11 million throughout the county, and 
we certainly expect that, that many of those dollars will be given out here. Um, our Human Relations and Community Service Department has finalized our Racial Equity Program grant. These are the dollars that, um, that were passed uh, by council and, and I had supported um, adding the additional 0.1% um, for racial equity. Um, there are two Zoom informational sessions coming up to provide an, inf an opportunity for those interested um, to, to request dollars and discuss the RFQP. And it's August 24th at 10 a.m. and September 1st at 1.30 p.m. Um, so you can go to their website for that. Uh, Councilwoman Spitzley mentioned Laugh is Life, which I gave to. I hope everybody will donate to. Um, I actually, I think I bought several tickets and just told them to donate the other tickets, but um, I think that's, it's incredible. Um, so I'm glad they're doing that. Um, August 26th through 28th from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. is a three-day furniture donation drive. Uh, St. Vincent Catholic Charities, I believe this is for the, um, the Afghan refugees who uh, we think are gonna be resettling. Um, they are asking for furniture, gently used. This isn't like get rid of your old trashy furniture. This is gently used furniture. But if you have gently used furniture, please bring it to St. Vincent Catholic Charities for their furniture donation drive, August 26th to 28th, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, the Board of Water and Light was mentioned several times. If they're still here, thank you. Um, I know our Office of Financial Empowerment is sharing that with everybody. Um, so Amber Paxton mentioned it to me, but it's already been mentioned twice, so I won't mention it a third time again. Um, September 10th, you all in the budget uh, allocated some money for expungement work, and we will have our expungement clinic and community resource fair at the Let's Community Center on Friday, September 10th. The event is open to the public, but uh, individuals interested in expunging a criminal conviction are encouraged to pre-register. Um, I think this is gonna be a great event. I know our legal department, um, so for, for Jim, our legal department, especially Amanda O'Boyle, are working so hard on this, and um, they're partnering with many others, with the Congresswoman's office and, and, uh, and several others, and I think it's gonna be a great event. Uh, Representative Graham Filler from the DeWitt area is actually involved also. Um, he passed the legislation. Um, I wanna compliment Councilwoman Spitzley. Uh, this, this Friday, she and I together are gonna be doing a, um, a Gift of Life organ donation event, um, but she really, um, took lead on this and I appreciate her work working with John Edmond, um, creating the, uh, the Amaya Alyssa Edmond Gift of Life Day to create awareness uh, for organ donation, which is tremendously important. I believe the recipient of her organs will be there as well. So thank you, Councilwoman, and I'm honored to stand with you and uh, talk about the importance here in Lansing. And finally, I'll be done. I wanna offer congratulations to Glenn Freeman III on his final retirement from the Greater Lansing Labor Council uh, he's being honored this week, and we all know Glenn, and uh, I'm happy that he's actually able to retire finally this time, I think. Um, but if he's out there watching somewhere, congratulations to Glenn. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Clerk. Okay, we have a show cause hearing tonight in consideration of orders to make safe or demolish for 125 East Mount Oak Avenue. Uh, we do not have anyone that has signed in to speak on that item. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Wood, did you have anything to add? Uh, thank you. The original uh, red tag date on this was June um, 7th, um, 2020. Um, the assessed value of um, the uh, is $29,700. The estimated <coughs> repairs are $195,000. And uh, no one showed up at um, the public safety meeting, and this is a fire damage property. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Okay, so for the referral of the show cause hearing, Committee on Public Safety. All right, we are to public comment on legislative matters. We have five public hearings. Uh, four of them have very similar language, so I will just simply state the topic simply. Um, the pilot for Apartments West, which we heard about in detail tonight, the pilot for Walter French, the pilot for Cedar Place, and the pilot for the Porter Senior Apartments. And then the fifth public hearing is in consideration of an ordinance amending Chapter 658 to replace willful annoyance with the prohibition that no person shall threaten another person by word of mouth, gesture, or other physical action that accosts, molests, or otherwise harasses that person. 
And we have no members of the public who have signed in to speak on legislative matters. Before we move on, anything to add, Council Member Spitzley? Very good. We will let the hearing stand for themselves. Mr. Clark, okay. Let's move on. Uh, we have the, uh, on the referral of the public hearings, um, numbers 8 through 11. The Committee on Public, Committee on Development Planning. And number 12, the annoying person. The Committee on Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Okay, then we are to the consent agenda. Uh, item 13 was already taken up, so it includes items 14 and 15. Uh, Mr. Vice President. Sure, so we have two items on the consent agenda tonight. The first is a resolution of reappointment for Nancy Malo as the first ward member of the Board of Public Service for a term to expire June 30th, 2025. And the second is a fee reduction resolution uh, for non-sufficient funds uh, pertaining to check fees. Uh, and this would um, reduce the fee from 50 to $25. All right. With that being said, I move the consent agenda. All, right. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Okay, we have a declaration of May 31st as the Amaya Elise Edmonds Gift of Life Day. Council Member Spitzley. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the mayor has already mentioned it, so I won't go into too much. I just want to let you know and let the public know that this month of August is National Minority Donor Awareness Month. Um, and National Minority Donor Awareness Month stems from the National Minority Donor Awareness Week, founded in 1996. Um, you know, we thought it was um, critically important to highlight the need for um, more education and awareness of um, minorities for organ donation. Um, for the, um, you know, the organ donation, particularly for kidneys, minorities make the largest percentage of folks waiting for a kidney simply because of the history of high blood pressure and diabetes. And so, um, we will be, um, and then we have three families here in the city of Lansing that have made that, you know, three minority families that have made that decision to have um, their loved one's organs donated, which I think is incredible that we have that. And so we're going to be having um, an event this, uh, this week, Friday at 10 a.m. Everybody's invited, they'll be getting, um, but to, you know, honor those families and to officially um, proclaim that May 31st as the Amaya Elise Edmonds Gift of Life Day. And with that, I'll move the resolution. It will be officially given to them on Friday. Thank you. That is a proper motion. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. Motion carries. Our next resolution is the grant acceptance. Council Member Wood. Uh, thank you, President Spadafore. Uh, the grant that uh, we have before us is um, for $100,000. Um, there will This will probably cost a little bit more than that before this is all said and done. Uh, what this will do will allow uh, the, finan the Treasurer's Office to purchase a uh, large commercial scanner uh, to do projects um, such as income tax and um, taxes through this large um, scanner. It's something that um, Grand Rapids has uh, utilized in the past and they have been working closely uh, with them. Um, what this would also do is currently we have our services with Coal America uh, that collects um, information and we pay between one hundred and twenty five to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year and that would be a cost that would be reduced. Um, uh, the only additional cost to this would be temporary help at the time uh, that scanning projects would be needed. So with that I would um, move the acceptance of the grant. It's a proper motion. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries six, Thank you. seven, six, zero. <laughs> all right, we are to speaker registration for public comment on city government related matters. If you wish to speak on any city matter, please sign the yellow form uh, within the next minute. And in the meantime, we are to reports of officers, boards, and commissions. Mr. Vice President. Sure, I move that all items be considered as read in full and appropriate referrals be made by you, President Spadafore. 
gladly accept that motion. Any all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. Motion carries, Mr. Clerk. Okay, we have um, minutes of boards and commissions. Placed on file. Uh, fireworks display license. Committee on city operations. Um, items from the mayor, a sole source purchase for the police department for school crossing guard services. Committee on ways and means. An um, ordinance to add chapter 256 and a separate resolution setting the public hearing for that. Uh, the committee of the whole. Uh, grant acceptance, stop violence against women grant. Committee on ways and means. Uh, setting a show cause hearing and the actual resolution adopting orders to make safe or demolish to 4511 South Martin Luther King the Boulevard. Of public safety. And grant acceptance, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Continuum of Care. Committee on Ways and Means. Uh, communications and Petitions, a claim appeal for trash removal fees at 1532 Illinois. Committee on City Operations. And an affidavit of disclosure, Willard Walker of the Human Relations and Community Services Department. The City Ethics Board. We are to motion of excused absence. I would entertain a motion to excuse the absent members by Councilmember Spitzley. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. All right, uh, additional remarks by council members? I see none. Or the mayor? He knows better. <laughs> All right, we are to public comment on city government related matters. Uh, we have Cynthia Ward. Your Honor. Thank you for waiting. Good evening, council. I'm Cynthia Ward. I felt like I should, uh, I should have left maybe 30 minutes ago because I'm going to now repeat what has already been stated by Council Member Dunbar, the representative from the Board of Water Light, from the mayor, and from the other agency representative. But I wanted to come before City Council because I still have tenants who are coming to court who are unaware of the COVID um, emergency rental assistance that is available. So I am very happy to have um, to, to hear it mentioned several times this evening. And because I'm not a quitter, I decided not to leave and that I will stay to the end of the meeting and offer offer and also offer my public comments on the matter. Um, it was just last week that I learned for the first time that internet assistance was also available to tenants, which is also um, very beneficial. So I was very happy to hear that offered this evening. As you know, we're conducting our court proceedings in a hybrid manner. So many of our tenants have to have internet access to connect to our court proceedings by Zoom. So for those tenants out there who may not need necessarily assistance with rental assistance, certainly the utility assistance is available, as well as I've just learned last week that there's internet assistance that is available that would be paid um, as a stipend directly to the tenants. The latest information that I receive says that there's about 16 point something, $16.3 million that's still available um, in Ingham County. I know that our district court, um, we were large users of that uh, COVID money. Our tenants are still struggling. Um, we give them the information for every uh, eviction matter that is filed. Every tenant is made aware of the rental assistance. Um, but I guess you can't share that information enough because people are still struggling and having difficult times. So thank you for giving me an opportunity to share that. But I also thank you for your own um, initiative and in sharing that information. Have a good evening. It's nice to see all of you. You too, Judge. And that was our final speaker. All right. Well, at 948, I will declare this meeting the Lansing City Council adjourned.